All right, let's get started. Hopefully you all can see. Oh, I think I just dropped. Hold on one second. All right, can everyone see me at home? Good evening and welcome to the virtual and or sorry hybrid Boise City Planning and Zoning Commission public hearing. A few things to start out for the good of the order. Everyone from the public entering the hearing has automatically been muted and cannot speak if they've joined virtually. As the item you're interested in comes up for discussion, you'll be called upon and unmuted. We will ask if you have slides to share, if you can use the planner slides for your visuals. If you have your own slides, <clears throat> your role will change to panelist. And this may log you off for a moment and log you back in, and then you'll have the capabilities to share your screen. A quick overview for Zoom. Um, as they are different depending on which device you're on. If you're on a smartphone, you'll be limited to only speaking and sharing your camera. If you're on a computer, you can share your webcam if you have one or your screen when called upon. Some laptops might not have microphone capabilities. <clears throat> if you wish to speak over the phone but watch on your computer, the phone number for the hearing is listed on the email you received when registering for tonight's hearing. For both smartphone and computer participation, there are controls on the bottom of Zoom to virtually raise your hand when you wish to speak on the item you're interested in. If you're attending on the phone with no visual capabilities, you can raise your hand virtually by typing in star nine. Again, that's star nine to raise your hand virtually on the phone. There is a chat function in Zoom. This is not part of the record and should only be used for te technical difficulties. If the chat function isn't available for you, you can email zoninginfo at cityofboise.org. Our procedures for public hearings begin with a presentation from the planning team. Then we'll go to the applicant and then the representative of the Registered Neighborhood Association, followed by questions from the commission. After that, we proceed to the in-person public testimony, starting with those who signed up on the electronic sign-up sheet in advance, and then anyone else who raises their hand in person and then we'll do that the same way for virtual attendees. Each member of the public is allowed up to three minutes for testimony, and we will stop you at that three minutes. We are strict with this time as it is limited in code. And then the applicant is allowed five minutes for rebuttal, after which the hearing will be closed and the commission will deliberate and render a decision. Tonight's agenda and proceedings uh, might have a bit of delay as we're yet again learning in this new hybrid format with in-person attendees and virtual attendees. 
Madam Chair, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, we are citizen volunteers appointed by the mayor and approved by the city council. We make final decisions on conditional use permits, variances and appeals and recommendations to the city council on subdivisions, rezones, annexations and code or comprehensive plan amendments. Any decision made tonight may be appealed by appealed to the city council provided that the appeal is filed within 10 days of this hearing. In order to file an appeal, you must have given written or oral testimony at tonight's meeting. So that's why it's important that you give your name and address when you testify tonight. We utilize a consent agenda. That means that if the applicant agrees with the staff report, and if there is no public opposition, the item will be placed on the consent agenda. All items that are placed on the consent agenda are approved with one motion without further public comment. For items not on the consent agenda, we will hold a full public hearing in the order just detailed a few minutes ago with staff, applicant, neighborhood association, and then the public testimony. Thank you all for being here tonight. And will the clerk please call the roll? Ed? Here. Schaefer? Here. Wires? Here. Blanchard? Here. Moore? Here. Stevens? Here. Gillespie? Here. Finfrock? Bratnober? Here. Eight present, one absent. Okay, without objection from the commission, we will place the March 2nd, 2020 and the March 9th, 2020 um, meeting minutes on the consent agenda. Um, and then the first item for consideration is uh, item A, which is CUP 17-93 and CVA 17-76 Broad Street Properties. This is a time extension at 406 South 5th Street for a conditional use permit for a height exception. Um, is the applicant present? If you're present virtually, please uh, virtually raise your hand. Okay, I do not see that the applicant is present at the meeting. Um, is there, oh wait, I am sorry, I am seeing it now, a hand raised. Uh, Mr. Sheldon is, um, are you in agreement with the terms and conditions of the staff report? To the, to, sorry, thank you for the time extension. Sorry, I'm a little new to Zoom, yes we are. Great, um, and is there anybody present to testify in opposition of this item tonight? Please virtually raise your hand or do so in person here. Okay, seeing no hands raised, uh, we will place item A on the consent agenda. The next item for consideration is item number one, PUD 20-17. Sean Overmeyer at 2316 South Phillip, Phillip E Street, conditional use permit for a planned residential development. Um, is the applicant present tonight? Please virtually raise your hand. There we go. Perfect. Um, and are you in agreement with the, um, with the staff report? Yes. Great. And is there anybody here tonight to testify in opposition of this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will place number one onto the consent agenda. Uh, the next item for consideration is item number two, SOS 20-14, Caldera Capital LLC at 2405 East Warm Springs Avenue. This is a waiver to the subdivision ordinance. Uh, is the applicant present? Great, I see a hand virtually. And um, are you in agreement with the terms and conditions of the staff report? Yes, I am. Great, she is in agreement. And is there anybody present to testify in opposition of this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll place item two on the consent agenda. Um, 
The next item for consideration, the last item for consideration of the consent agenda is item number three. This is PUD 20-16, Elder LLC at 1011 South Orchard Street, a conditional use permit for planned residential development. Um, is the applicant present? Great, and are you in agreement with the terms and the conditions of the staff report? Uh, yes, we are. Great, hearing that they are. Um, is there anybody present tonight that wanted to testify in opposition of this item? I do see a hand raised. And just to clarify, sir, you are here to testify in opposition? Yes. Okay, okay, we can, um, we cannot answer your questions, but the applicant may have the opportunity, will have the opportunity if they'd like to, to, um, to answer those questions for you after your testimony. So we will not place item three on the consent agenda. Um, okay, and then the chair will entertain a motion. Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. I move uh, to approve the following items on the consent agenda. Item A, CUP 17-93 and CVA 17-76. Item 1, PUD 20-17. And item 2, SOS 20-14. I'm the person. <laughs> and the meeting minutes from March 2nd and March 9th. Second. Great. We have a second from Commissioner Gillespie. Um, will the clerk please call the vote? Stead? Aye. Schaefer? Yes. Squires? Yes. Blanchard? Aye. Moore? Aye. Stevens? Aye. Gillespie? Aye. Ratnober? Aye. All in favor, motion carries. Okay, great. So the first item then that we will address is item B. Um, this is SUB 20-8, Haystack Subdivision Number 1 at 3006 South Wise Way. And we'll first hear from staff. So Ms. Womack, please. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, the first item on tonight's agenda is a request for a preliminary and final plat on 10.69 acres in an SBO1 zone. The residential subdivision is comprised of one common and two buildable lots. The proposed lots comply with the dimensional standards of the SB01 zone and the Harris Ranch specific plan. Harris, the Harris Ranch specific plan designates the site as mixed use commercial and high density residential. The proposed street layout matches the circulation plan for the area. All of the buildings will be required to comply with the dimensional requirements of the SP01 zone and will require design review approval prior to receiving building permits. The lot layout of the Western Block 2 will comply with these pro block prototypes, which show a large mixed use block with several configuration possibilities, including office, commercial, a storage unit facility, and or apartment and condominium buildings. The proposed lot layout of the Eastern Block 1 will comply with these block prototypes, which show a village center, block with neighborhood retail, commercial, or residential on the first floor, and office or residential above. The applicant proposes to extend Wise Way, Haystack Street, Trailwood Way, and Old Hickory Way. Future roundabouts at Wise Way and Old Hickory Way's intersections with Warm Springs will be constructed once traffic counts warrant construction. Eventually, and if warranted, the specific plan has Warm Springs Ave planned as a four-lane arterial roadway with two-lane wide roundabouts at each intersection. However, it was determined that no improvements to Warm Springs Ave or the intersections would be needed at this time. ACHD required additional right-of-way be dedicated to accommodate the future construction of these dual-lane roundabouts. As mentioned in the project report, Barber Valley Neighborhood Association and several neighbors have concerns with the expansion of Warm Springs to four lanes. Um, sub 1956 referenced was approved at City Council on June 2nd, 2020. Direction was given to staff to research the process in which the specific plan could be amended to reduce Warm Springs Ave from five lanes to three lanes. Currently, the closest north-south pedestrian connection shown with the yellow stars here 
across Warm Springs Ave as the rapid flashing beacon at the entrance to Marion Williams Park, 217 feet to the west of the site. An additional RRFB has been approved to the east at Millbrook Way. As covered in the late correspondence, the applicant has proposed an RRFB at Old Hickory Way in Warm Springs Ave, which was not reviewed by ACHD. Similar to the efforts on Warm Springs, the applicant will continue to work with ACHD to undertake the appropriate warrant study and attempt to gain permission to put an RRFB at Old Hickory Way in Warm Springs Ave within ACHD right-of-way. This will place RRFBs at all future roundabouts, creating consistent spacing and streetscape along Warm Springs. Regarding the neighbors' school capacity and bicycle route concerns, the Boise School District reviewed the project with no concerns. At this time, only a preliminary and final plot is before the commission in order to create the proposed lots and to continue to extend right of way. The use and density of the site has been established by the adopted Harris Ranch specific plan. As the future school site within Harris Ranch is pl planned out, safe routes to school will further prior prioritize these efforts and will and continue this effort specifically to accommodate school children. As condition, the planning team recommends approval of the application with conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Womack. Um, so next we'll hear from the applicant. And we'll start with 10 minutes. Hello there, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you've got Heath Clark representing the applicant and I'm hoping to be able to share my screen. Keith, one moment while we change your role. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, for the record, Heath Clark, 251 East Front Street in Boise, uh, representing the applicant. Uh, this is uh, the Haystack subdivision number one. And as we start tonight, I thought it might be helpful to give a little bit of background about the project. Um, I know that not all of the commissioners have, have been around Harris Ranch as much. And so I thought it might be a little bit helpful to describe where we are in the process and kind of how we got here. So Harris Ranch, of course, is Boise City's first specific plan district. Uh, back in 2007, Harris Ranch was approved after years of charrettes and public hearings and discussions and compromises. And we're now 13 years into the project. As a specific plan, it operates with its own zoning code. So this is a, a depiction from our SPO1 manual. It shows the entire development with each block shaded according to the type of use that's permitted. Uh, the first several years of the project were focused north of East Park Center. Uh, we are now moved south and the project that is up before you tonight is on these two blocks that I've indicated. This is a highly interconnected community that prizes bike and ped connectivity. This map shows in red paved bike lanes throughout the project or the inner areas of the grid. We'll see many local streets with 15 foot urban sidewalks to provide safe pedestrian and bike connectivity. The project overall is ringed by pathways, concrete walks in the green belt. So with regard to the application that's actually before you, as Nicolette mentioned, this is a preliminary and final plat application for the two lots on 10.69 acres. Uh, I want to be clear that this does fully conform with SP01. Uh, this is not a new proposal for new units. Um, this is within the units that were approved with, for SP01 back in 2007. Uh, ACHD, the city, schools, they all approved SP01 with that specified number of units, and this does not represent a change. And I'll conclude uh, just by saying that the applicants in full agreement with the terms and conditions of the staff report. Um, we also want to say that we appreciate uh, the interaction that we continue to have with Barber Valley Neighborhood Association and their support. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Clark. 
Um, next, we'll move to uh, the Neighborhood Association. Do we have a representative from Barber Valley here to speak on this tonight? I see John Mooney. Okay, great. Just one moment while we upgrade you. Madam Chair, Commissioners, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I think Nick Lett has, has a, our short slide deck. Uh, for the record, uh, this is John Mooney, Barber, Barber Valley Neighborhood Association, 7153 East Highland Valley Road. And as you saw in our late correspondence, we're in full support. And, and uh, as Heath said, this is a very collaborative effort between the applicant and the neighborhood. Uh, so I just want to take the opportunity to kind of run through a few of the neighborhood uh, perspectives uh, that Heath didn't cover. The next slide, please. Thanks. Um, the point here is SE7 is a school, which isn't obviously in your purview tonight. The village center is the TC8 and 9, and the mixed use commercial is the purples there in the middle. So SW12 and 13 are big, big uh, chunks of Harris Ranch, and we're real excited about this. SC5 down the right hand corner, we testified before you in April and hope to make the points that we were finally able to make at council last week. Next slide. Uh, and that was uh, regarding the amendment seven, which was adopted last year. Unfortunately, we missed a lot of things in that uh, the neighborhood association did. And we probably would have been a little bit more uh, interested in looking at, re-looking at the bicycle facilities in particular. Um, but what also came out of that in the applicant is great about uh, dealing with this is we really want to tackle the master street map and the future of Warm Springs, which also is not in the scope of this, but we've been scratching our heads uh, throughout this process as how do we, how do we interact with this and get uh, another amendment to the specific plan. Um, as you can see on this slide, it's a two lane parkway with a dual lane roundabouts, which we believe is going to be a big problem for the neighborhood down the road. Uh, as the bullets in the bottom left show, we had strong neighborhood support to change this to a single lane parkway with a single lane roundabouts. And that resulted in a number of letters to city council for the hearing last week, which then resulted as you saw in the late correspondence with uh, direction from council to staff to, to begin this process. Next slide, please. Uh, we support this obviously. Um, and second bullets there is just kind of why we're going over this again with you is that we don't know any other way to kind of tackle uh, how do we start an amendment from out of the public if we see something that needs uh, attention. Uh, we believe the two lane parkway, the dual lane will adversely impact the connectivity to and from uh, this subdivision as well as the, obviously the Harris Ranch Town Center. Uh, the single lane parkway will greatly benefit all the vulnerable road users because it'll ease the crossing of Warm Springs in the future and obviously also support the connectivity uh, goals in uh, the comp plan. Next slide. We do remain a little bit concerned about lack of bike facilities with, within the interior grid. As, as uh, Mr. Park just said, the, the streetscapes are outstanding uh, in the interior grid. But what they do is they, they basically, they're wide sidewalks. And so they're kind of either asking a bicyclist that's coming off the green belt or through one of those traffic circles into the town center. You're basically asking a bicyclist to then in that yellow highlighted area, either ride on the road with sharrows, share, share the lane with a vehicle or ride on the sidewalk, which in best practices and at the risk of kind of throwing New, new ideas into a great plan, uh, that, that's not optimum and we just continue to be a bit concerned about that. Um, as you can see, there's a, the bike lanes are gonna come off of those two traffic circles and be an issue. The cross section, next slide, uh, for that highlighted area, uh, as you can see, there's 11 foot traffic lane, eight feet of parking, and then a wide sidewalk. Um, so as I said before, a bicyclist that's gonna go down that street from this subdivision to get to the town center or the new school is gonna be either in the vehicle lane, 11 foot vehicle lane or on the sidewalk. Next slide. So our, our request is obviously prove this plat and, and please continue to emphasize the need for an amendment because obviously it's, the work's not been done yet and until it's done, it's gonna be an outstanding concern of the neighborhood. Next slide or next build, I think. I think that's it. Uh, we talked about this already. Next bullet. I think that's the end of it. 
many thanks because uh, that late correspondence, we were unaware of the fact that the applicant also uh, uh, volunteered to put this RRFB in at Hickory Way and Warm Springs. Uh, and that's outstanding. We are, there is a kind of a disconnect. The, the wise way crossing is an RFB, a red flasher brings traffic to a stop. Whereas uh, Hickory and Millbrook, the next two uh, turn circles roundabouts will be our RFBs, which is flashing yellow lights. Uh, so there is kind of a, a traffic question there that we need to maybe solve down the road. I think that's it. Next slide, Nicolette. Think that. There we go. Thank you, John Mooney from Barber Valley Neighborhood Association. Thank you, Mr. Mooney. Um, next, we'll move on to questions from the commission for the applicant, the staff, or the neighborhood association. Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. Just a quick question for staff. Nicolette, is there any motion you need from us regarding the RRFB? and work with ACHD and or the uh, double roundabout discussion that's ongoing. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Schaefer, uh, a motion is not needed, but it would, uh, if you think it has merit, I, I would include it in your deliber deliberation. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. Well, with that incitement to speak from Nicolette, I will simply put on the record, um, uh, dropping, you know, putting putting warm strings on a on a diet through there, which is what I think the BVNA wants to do, seems like a, an idea really, really worth considering. Uh, I think it's going from four lanes to three, and presumably using that extra space to create dedicated bike lanes is, I think, a great idea. And I hope that SPO one can be amended to enable that, or that ACHD just does it on their own. I'm never sure which comes first. Um, I'm not sure what kind of deliberations we need on the rapid flashing beacon light. Um, I don't have, I'm sort of agnostic as to whether it flashes yellow or red. Uh, I'll defer to people who understand that better, but I think we do want to have really great pedestrian connectivity through those roundabouts and if they were two lane roundabouts instead of three, and if they have the right pedestrian signals instead of the wrong ones, that's that's better. So <laughs> I'm on the record there, Nicolette, for, for supporting those, those initiatives. But I'm not hearing that it requires a change of any motion or you know, any change in our findings. Do you have any questions for the for the staff or the applicant? <laughs> No, I guess the question for BVNA for John and for Nicolette is, you know, is that is that a sufficient set of deliberations on the record for you, even if they're in the wrong place? <laughs> Which uh, I often do, according to my wife. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Gillespie, I I believe that's a, sufficient. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry about that, Madam Chairman. Do we have any additional questions from the commission? Okay, seeing none, um, we also don't have anybody signed up from the public to speak on this issue. If there's anybody, first I'll ask, is there anybody here in the room tonight that would like to speak to this issue? Okay, seeing none, then my next question will be for everybody attending virtually. Please virtually raise your hand if you'd like to speak to this issue. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move to a five minute rebuttal from the applicant. Mr. Clark again, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just briefly, uh, with regard to the flasher, uh, you know, our, our intent is to request a, a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, the yellow type. We think that that's gonna have more likelihood of success. And um, so that's the, that's the direction that we're planning to go there. Uh, with regard to the Warm Springs bypass, um, we, you know, we've been talking to, to BBNA about that uh, for quite a while at, at this point, um, and we, you know, appreciate the, the work they've done on that. We, we look forward to continuing to engage in that. 
Um, that is a, a separate process from what we're doing tonight. And so I think that Commissioner Gillespie's uh, description of the, the PNZ's uh, intent that this should be something that explored further, I think that's adequate and appropriate that it was processed that way. With that, I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll close the public portion of the hearing and the um, item is before the commission. Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. Hope I'm on the right one. I'm a little kid. This is very disorienting this way. It is very, very <laughs> um, I move that we approve SUB 20-08, or we recommend approval to the city council of SUPB 20-08 with all the terms and conditions in the staff report. I will second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Gillespie and a second from Commissioner Schaefer. Is there further discussion? Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. I request that all of my verbose comments that were in the question section be moved to this point here. Noted. Thank you. Any further discussion? Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. I think the uh, staff report adequately, adequately sums up um, project and the application, um, I'm in full support and I will second uh, Commissioner Gillespie's previous comments in regards to the RFBs, whichever, whichever color is most appropriate. Uh, we'll leave that to the experts. Uh, and also I'm in support of additional study of reducing uh, Warm Springs down to a single lane uh, and at the roundabouts as well. Any further discussion? Okay, will the clerk please call the vote? Stead? Aye. Schaefer? Aye. Wires? Aye. Blanchard? Aye. Moore? Aye. Stevens? Aye. Gillespie? Aye. Brattenover? Aye. All in favor, motion carries. Okay, so moving on to item number three. Uh, this is PUD 20 16, Elder LLC at 10. 11 South Orchard Street. This is a conditional use permit for a planned residential development. Um, and we'll first hear from Mr. Letson. Maybe, maybe not, actually. We'll hear from staff. Oh. Hi, Madam Chair. Mr. Letson, you're up. Mr. Letson, and apologize for the pandemic beard. I think that was done last week too by my coworker, Kevin Holmes. But um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. So here we go. All right, let me know when you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the commission. The item before you is an eight unit multifamily planned unit development located at 1110 South Orchard Street in an LOD zone. Located on the west side of Orchard Street between Kootenay Street and Camus, uses in the surrounding area include varying densities of residential to the north and east and offices and parking lots to the south and west. Casha Park is located one quarter of a mile to the northeast. Transit stops exist on the, at the intersection of Orchard and Kootenay as pictured here. The project consists of an eight unit multifamily building arranged in a townhome style all required setbacks have been met or exceeded. Each unit has an oversized single car garage and parking available on the driveway apron in front of the garage. Private patios and balconies provide the 100 square feet of open space required for PUDs of this size. The project will be accessed via Orchard Street. As a recommended condition of approval, a cross access agreement with the office building to the south must be approved by the city and recorded prior to the issuance of any construction permits. And I'll highlight this cross access drive here off of Orchard Street. And in fact, if we go back and look at the larger aerial, there's access around the building to allow exiting on the Kootenay Street as well. So the nature of that agreement will be to have access along the entire rear of the building, which will better accommodate emergency service and solid waste pickup. <clears throat> All reviewing agencies and departments approved the project with standard conditions 
And to this point, no comments were received from the public. In conclusion, the planning team recommends approval of PUD 20-16 with the attached conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Letson. Um, next, we'll hear from the applicant and we'll start with 10 minutes. Madam Chair, the applicant is present. I'm not sure if they need to use my slides. We've already talked about coordinating that. So just as a heads up. Can the applicant virtually raise their hand, please? There we go. Uh, go ahead, please, applicant, and please start with your name and address. Yeah, this is Renee Rains. The address is 11844 Chinden Ridge in Boise, Idaho, 83714. And um, I'm with Commercial Broker Connect. Oops. Sorry, I guess I was getting some feedback there. Um, and then we're in agreement with the uh, Leon Lutzen's uh, conditions and cross access agreement. We work hard on this project and, uh, and with Leon to uh, satisfy his conditions on the alleyway. And um, and we feel that this is a good project for the area due to the fact that um, there's a lot of office and as subdivisions right around there. So uh, Renee, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're having a difficult time hearing you. Is there anything you can do to adjust that, the sound a little bit? Is this better? A little bit. It's still very quiet. The feedback is gone. Yeah, let me see. Is this any better? It, no, it sounds like maybe you're far from the microphone. Could that be? Yeah, let's see. Renee, do you maybe have the video on in the background that needs to be muted? Um, is this any better for you? We'll have to make do. It's okay. It's a, it's pretty quiet. Um, just try to speak up if you can. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I thought I had a uh, dial in line, but uh, I guess I just have to deal with this uh, microphone. Renee, we, we might have you to with Leon and his cross staff. We might need you to call in rather than um, on your phone rather than whatever device you're on right now. The feedback in the council chambers is pretty, pretty bad. So I'm not sure what the number is to dial in. The phone number would have been on the email when you registered for the Zoom meeting this afternoon okay. or this evening. Let me get that. Yeah, the, the same place where you found that link tonight to log in. Madam Chair, this is uh, Leon Letson. For the benefit of the commission, um, I think the online listeners are having an easier time with Ms. Rames than you are. So far, she's confirmed that she's in agreement with staff's recommendation and conditions. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. So this is a question for Leon. This is Commissioner Gillespie. Leon, um, if you can communicate with her or vice versa, is that all she wants to say or does she have anything to add to her agreement? Um, what I've heard and through conversations prior to the hearing, they are in support of what we have recommended. She wanted to make a point of stating they've been working hard on the project as well. Um, and if I'll pause to allow Ms. Rains to clarify any points if that's um, necessary, but again, they I know are... we'll want to get her squared away before because we have some questions that was going to be put on the record. Um, yeah. 
So, um, Renee, do you will you be able to call in on a phone? Um, I'm not seeing the phone number on the email. Okay, bear with us, please, one moment. We're pulling it up here. So, um. Okay. In the meantime, we're going to just move on to the public testimony, and we'll come back to Renee um, in the rebuttal, hopefully on the on a different device. Um, Madam Chair, if yeah. if there are any questions from the commissioners yes. before we do public testimony, thank you. Yeah. So, are there? Do we have questions from the commission for the staff or the um, applicant? Madam Chair, I have a question for staff. Uh, Commissioner Blanchard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Leon, do we have uh, any kind of correspondence from the neighbor directly to the north? Did I miss that? Yeah, Madam Chair, Commissioners, to this point, there's been no public comment of any kind. So the person in attendance is the first person to comment on the project. Okay. Any further questions from the commission? Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. Uh, this is a question for staff. Uh, Leon, is this um, next headed for design review? What's the next step in the process? Yeah, Madam Chair, Commissioner Schaefer, yes. Design review is the next stop for this project. We've yet to apply. Um, there have been numerous conversations with the applicant about design review requirements. They've spoken to design review. So there will be some updates. Materials used to a certain extent, um, but yes, they have coordinated with design review, and that will be the next stop for the project. Okay, thanks. Madam Chair, just a quick additional question for staff. Sure, Commissioner Blanchard. Leon, is that going to require additional public noticing? Uh, Madam Chair, I may defer to my a manager here about staff level design reviews. I believe there will be notification associated with the staff level approval. Um, this would be a staff level approval in the event that the commission approves the PUD proposed tonight. Um, so Saline, if you're with me, I believe we do notice for staff level design reviews. Madam Chair, Commissioner Blanchard, we do not notice for staff level design reviews. Sorry, you caught me off guard, Leon. I'm trying to still help Renee call in. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um, any further questions from the commission? Thank you both. Okay, and seeing none before, I just wanted quickly, before we move on to the public comment, I just wanted to check to see if we had any representative from the Central Bench Neighborhood Association here tonight. If you are online, please virtually raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, um, and we don't have anybody on the sign up list. Please, anybody that would like to testify, please virtually raise your hand or please come on up to the, to the podium. I have a couple of questions about that. Okay, leave this on. Okay. You can take that off. Okay. My name is Robbie, R O B B I E, Robinson, R O B I N S O N. And I live at 1009 South Archer Street. And I also run a photography and video business out of my home, occupational. My biggest questions are this, that alley between that property, it's a two-story building. That's an alley that provides driveway to the back of that property. Are they going to improve that? alley so they can make it a uh, street and the vehicle to be able to go in and out of that. The other thing is, is the traffic flow right there. You got a light on that corner of Orchard and Kootenai. And sometimes it can be a hassle getting in and out. So those are my biggest concerns. And like right now, um, there's, I use a um, part of the property 
to turn around and to get in and out, but it's a double uh, driveway there. And if they would allow me to, I would pour the cement to make that a double uh, area there for my customers to park in and out, even though it's on that piece of property, if they don't mind. That's all. Thank you so much. Um, is there anybody else here or online that would like to testify on this item tonight? Please come on up or virtually raise your hand. Okay, seeing none. Um, it looks like, do we have Renee on the phone now? Okay, so we'll move on to a rebuttal for from the applicant for five minutes, please. Uh, can you hear me okay now? That's great, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. And so as I was saying before that um, we have worked hard on the site and in response to the request for the alleyway, we are improving that and there should be flow through there to come in and out like Leon had mentioned um, regarding the emergency vehicles. And um, uh, we've kind of uh, created a um, uh, area for the uh, party to the north uh, where we've given them a little bit more room and, um, you know, we, we're not encumbering their space either. But we did send out um, the uh, neighborhood notices also as requested. So they were informed of the um, hearing and, you know, what we're doing. You done? Thank you. Um, so at this point, we will close the public portion of the hearing and the item is before the commission. Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. I move that we approve PUD 20-16 with all the terms and conditions of the staff report. I'll second. Second from Commissioner Schaefer. So we have a um, motion on the table to to approve PUD 20-16, um, is there any discussion? Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. Uh, as we knew, know from many recent hearings and from reading the paper, we really need to add um, housing units, especially in that part of the city. Um, I strongly support the project. I think it's a, it's a good addition to that part of Orchard Street and it sounds like the applicant has done a good job of working with the neighbors to to improve the access or maintain the access for everybody. Any further discussion? <clears throat> okay, seeing none, uh, will the clerk please call the vote? Stead? Aye. Schaefer? Aye. Wires? Aye. Blanchard? Aye. Moore? Aye. Stevens? Aye. Gillespie? Aye. Bratton over? Aye. All in, favor, all in favor, motion carries. Okay, we'll take a quick five minute break before we move on to item four. So we'll come back here at about 52.
Okay, so we are moving on to item number four. This is CAR 20-5 and PUD 20-13 South Point LLC um, at 9933 and 10151 West Victory Road. Um, first, we will hear from staff. So the floor is yours, Mr. Holmes. And lovely to see you in person. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Before you is a request for the annexation of 19.6 acres located at 9933 and 10151 West Victory Road with an R1B single family residential zoning. A conditional use permit for a 18.5 acre planned residential development comprised of 67 single family homes and a preliminary plat comprised of 67 buildable lots and six common lots is included. The property shown here in red is located on the southwest corner of the intersection of Victor Road and Mitchell Street in Southwest Boise. The property is located within the Boise City area of impact and has a large lot land use designation. Cross Victory Road to the north lies neighborhood zoned R1B and to the east is a smaller neighborhood with an R1A zoning designation. Properties to the south and west remain within Ada County with a southwest community residential zoning. <clears throat> All surrounding properties consist of, a, of single family residential neighborhoods of varying levels of density. As you can see here, lots to the north generally are in the 7,000 to 10,000 square foot range. To the west are half acre lots, which then increase in size as you leave areas annexed into the city to the south and east, where properties, properties generally are around an acre. There are two existing homes identified here in orange, which are proposed to be demolished, while the existing home in the southwest corner is proposed to remain and be incorporated, incorporated into the new development. The proposed subdivision is accessed off Mitchell Street with pedestrian and emergency connections out to Victory Road and has a density of 3.61 units per acre below the 4.8 units per acre allowed in the R1B zone. As you can see on the plat here, smaller lots are proposed along Victory Road and generally increase in size towards the south and west. This table here at the bottom shows the dimensional standards associated with the requested R1B zoning and then what the applicant is proposing with their PUD application. As you can see, minimum lot areas and widths, as well as interior and rear setbacks are all requested to be reduced. The 14 homes along the southern boundary, shown here uh, highlighted in blue, are all requested, um, excuse me, are proposed to retain the typical dimensional standards of the R1B zone, except for reduced interior side setbacks of 15 feet. Uh, the planning team is generally supportive of these overall reductions with one recommended condition of approval to limit any homes built on the 14 southern lots to a single story if they do utilize less than a 10 foot interior side setbacks typical of the R1B zone. This would retain building patterns more consistent with the large lot land use designation as well as provide an appropriate transition to the neighborhood to the south. The primary amenity provided to the subdivision, besides drought tolerant plantings, is this central common lot, which is just a bit less than an acre in size and situated around an existing open pond. Proposed improvements include a gravel walking path, seating areas, and a boulder play area. This amenity does a good job in preserving existing natural features and provides for a shared open space for residents, both items which are called for in the large lot land use designation. We do recommend that to improve and increase the usability of this amenity, a couple modifications be made. These include reconfiguring the layout of the lot to include an, an ADA accessible walking path on both the east and west sides of the pond to create a walkable loop for residents, potentially along lines of what's shown here in red. It is recommended that this path be buffered on either side by a minimum of eight feet of clearance between the pond and any property lines to allow for the planting of additional trees or preferably the uh, retention of existing trees. So speaking of trees, as you can see in this aerial, the property does have a significant number of mature trees on it. While no tree mitigation plan has been submitted, the applicant has 
provided a breakdown of how many trees they anticipate removing with this development, development, as well as how many new trees will be planted. So first I'd like to point out that the applicant has agreed to retain the trees along the southern property line to buffer the existing homes from this new development. This is fully supported by the planning team as, and is an included condition of approval. Another recommended condition of approval that will increase the number of new trees is detaching the internal sidewalks within development. This should add an estimated 70 or so new trees as well as having the added benefit of increased pedestrian safety. As detailed in the project report, the total number of trees is proposed to increase over the number of existing trees now on the property. So to verify these numbers, a recommended condition of approval includes the submittal of a tree mitigation plan for review and approval prior to the issuance of any grading permits. Um, you notice this condition was inadvertently left out of the project report. Um, so if you agree that it is appropriate here, uh, you will have to include it in any motion this evening. The planning team has received a significant number of comments on this project since it was originally submitted in February. In general, these comments focused on the density of the development, impacts to local roadways, and effects to the irrigation and drainage facilities on the site, as well as the preservation of rural open space and the two potentially historic buildings. These items were all included in your project packet and late correspondence, and I'm sure you'll hear about them more in depth from those in attendance this evening. In conclusion, as detailed in the project report and highlighted in this presentation, the planning team finds the applicant's proposal to be consistent with the standards of approval, including the development code, blueprint Boise, and requirements of all reviewing agencies and departments. As such, the planning team recommends approval of the applications with conditions. Uh, for your reference here, I've included that uh, recommending condition related to the tree mitigation as well. For PUDs, the commission is the decision-making body, and for annexations and subdivision, it is the recommending body to city council. Thank you, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Um, next, we'll move on to the applicant. If we can first have the applicant virtually raise their hand. Oh, we have got you all queued up. <laughs> Hi again, Mr. Clark. <laughs> Please go Hi, ahead everybody. and start with 10 minutes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I hope you missed me over the last 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, so Heath Clark, 251 East Front Street, representing the applicant and the Conger Group. Uh, I'm going to turn on the screen share here and walk through uh, our project. So if, if, has everyone got the screen up? Great, yes, thank, thank you. you. So uh, we're here tonight to talk about the proposed music community, which we uh, would like to develop on 20 acres located at Victory Road in Mitchell. The community will include 67 residential units for a density of 3.61 units per acre. While all required connectivity is provided, there are no stubs to this property. And that's something that'll come up again later as we continue this conversation. Uh, that means that there are no through roads. It largely functions independently. Um, another item that I wanna point out and that we'll come back to through the course of the project or the discussion tonight is the pond in the center area of the project that Kevin described to you. I wanna talk about a couple of highlights and then circle back on some items that have been raised by members of the public. So we'll, first we'll talk about some of the design themes. Uh, this is very much not a cookie cutter type subdivision. There's been a lot of thought put into that um, through the course of conversations with the seller, which includes the Dunkley family. And as you can imagine, that's where the name of the project comes from. Uh, in addition, we've talked about, I'll talk about some of the amenities, uh, talk about the transition that's been proposed here, and then we'll talk about the trees as Kevin mentioned. So first, let's look at the, the theme of the project. Um, the, the, the project will have a distinct look to it. One of our sellers, again, the Dunkleys, uh, will be residing here and will be remaining in their, in their, own, in their existing home. So there's uh, a lot of thought that's been put into what this neighborhood's gonna look like while they continue to live there. Um, we identified with them what they would like to see, and that is a condition of our sale is a requirement that the product have this modern farm house type of look. Um, one thing I'll point out, and this was an error in the application materials, there is no three-story product that's proposed. It is only two-story product, but this gives you uh, an idea of what the project will look like through its development. Uh, next, with regard to community amenities, uh, we do have 12.9% landscaped open space. Uh, common areas are going to use drought tolerant plantings and water conserving sprinkler design. 
uh, the type of sprinkler design that we use will result in 30 to 40% less, less water use. Uh, a, ma a major element of the project is the retention of the existing pond. Uh, we are in agreement with staff's condition with regard to the pond, and we will add the pathway on the west side as staff has indicated. And then finally, we do have a shade structure that will be included as well as climbing boulders. So nice amenities for the future residents. Now, this is infill development. And with infill, there are always challenges. Um, in this case, we're dealing with older subdivisions on the south, more recent subdivisions on the north, and the location that's on the edge of two comprehensive plan designations, large lot and suburban. So as, as Kevin mentioned, we, do, we did try to lay out our largest lots on the south side of the project with the goal of aligning the lot lines. And then we increase the density to the north as you reach up to the Victory Minor Arterial and the boundary of the large lot and suburban uh, uh, comprehensive plan designations. The choice of zoning, R1B, is part of that overall transition plan. As staff has mentioned, R1B is a permitted zone within the large lot designation. It also matches the zoning designation of the property immediately to the north. We're again talking about property also that is on a, a significant transportation corridor. So we think that the choice of an R1B designation and the density which is within R1B is appropriate. Uh, I, I do wanna continue this transition discussion with uh, some talk about the Southern boundary. Um, we've given that a great deal of thought um, that southern boundary has a subdivision that is from the, the late 1960s. Uh, we are not subject to the CCNRs for that project that, that restrict the lot sizes there. Um, this picture helps illustrate a couple of things. Uh, one, those ho houses are about 175 feet from our southern boundary. Uh, in addition, uh, several of those homes are two-story. The zoning back there is RSW, uh, which means they have a 25 foot rear setback. Ours is larger with a 30 foot rear setback. Um, as Kevin mentioned, in order to make that transition continue to work, we are proposing to keep this line of trees in place. So we think we've done a pretty admirable job of trying to transition um, from this county RSW subdivision into this uh, city of Boise subdivision that, that meets the city's goals. With regard to trees, uh, we have engaged an arborist to review the trees. Uh, based on what we've seen so far, we expect to be able to maintain more than 200 of the existing trees. As was mentioned, the trees on the southern boundary are also intended to remain. And that's also true of the trees around the pond where, where it's possible. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, as you know, life, uh, trees have a, a definite lifespan. Uh, in order to bring in the, the new generation, as it were, we, we will be planting our, a, a number of new trees. Um, the staff report cited a number of 297. That does not include uh, new tree plantings in the backyards. That is only that only includes trees within the front yards and in the common areas. So let's talk about some of the concerns in the neighbor testimony. Um, I what we saw was a lot of conversation about density, and I think I've I've tried to address that already with regard to the discussions about transition. Um, the other items that we saw were concerns about transportation and traffic and conversation about uh, retaining or documenting the, some of the existing homes. So with regard to traffic, um, ACHD has reviewed and approved this project. Um, they looked at some of the neighbor concerns and for example, determined that there was no signal warrant at Victory Road and Mitchell Street. And I'll also point out that the applicant did not request and was not granted an approach on the Victory Road, the minor arterial, the only access which is appropriate is the, at Mitchell. In addition, uh, the applicants required, uh, agreed to the required mitigation, including dedication of right-of-way along Victory 
and the addition of a left turn lane from Mitchell Street to Victory Road. So we believe that the, the traffic concerns have been addressed per the ACHD report. With regard to the existing homes on the site, uh, we are working with both sellers uh, regarding existing homes. So the Dunkley home is going to remain, the family's gonna stay there too. Um, with regard to the other homes, uh, what we're talking about is the two structures that are up closer to Victory Road. Uh, those homes are unique, uh, but they're not historic and we're unable to retain them for sale to third parties. Uh, the reasoning for that is they are not built to, to current energy or electrical codes, and there are structural deficiencies in those buildings. But that said, um, the story of those buildings is important, and we're taking steps to honor that. Um, the seller of that property continues to have ties to the, uh, the family that built those homes, and we have an agreement with the seller uh, to work on a, an interpretive plaque to be developed on the pond pathway to hopefully honor some of that. And then in addition, we are in agreement with the staff's condition to allow the Idaho State Historical Preservation or Idaho State Historical Society to come in and, and to, to document the buildings. So with that, I'll wrap up. There is one item that we would like to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission to review in connection with the proposed staff conditions. Um, as I mentioned early on, uh, this is an infill project. It does not have stubs from neighboring properties. Um, we've provided all the connectivity that we can and we meet the city's connectivity standards on that front. But to be clear, this is not a, a through situation. The only traffic coming into this project is going to be residents. Uh, we wouldn't ask this in a, in a through situation, but in this case, we think that five feet attached sidewalks are appropriate. Uh, it permits the homeowners to have larger rear yards. In other words, it, re requiring detached doesn't, in our view, have a real safety impact, and it comes at the cost of taking away in a, what could be an additional eight feet in each family's backyard. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to stand for questions. We do request approval with the single change to condition four and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, before we go to questions from the commission, we'll hear from the Neighborhood Association. In this case, that's the SWACA. Please start with your name and address and we'll start with 10 minutes. Uh, my name is Marissa Keith. I'm the president of the Southwest Data County Alliance Neighborhood Association, and I'm at 3279 South Cloverdale Road in Boise. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you for serving on this committee and being here tonight. SWACA would first like to have on record that we object to this meeting format when not everyone has an opportunity to come to City Hall in person and be present at the hearing. If not able to participate on Zoom, some people have been restricted to written comment only if only if they are concerned with venturing down to City Hall for health reasons during this pandemic. So um, SWACA is requesting the following, should this development be approved. Uh, we would like the zoning to be R1A with minimum lot sizes of 20,000 square feet. This area is designated as a large lot on the future land, land use map. According to Blueprint Boise, large lots should feature homes on lots ranging from a half to one acre in size, typically one or two units per acre. At the very least, the majority of lots in this development should have a fourth of an acre or 10,890 square feet to comply with the Southwest Comprehensive Plan 1.7, which discusses transition to quarter acre lots abutting existing large lot developments. Southwest Boise has thousands of small lots that have been approved and not yet built. This developer has at least 83 of these small lots already approved within a few miles of here. A um, few newer subdivisions provide transitional lot sizes and fewer still offer large lots, which is a desired feature for many people. SWACA maintains that larger lot sizes will be more compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods than will this current plat. Um, the trees, we would like the, to preserve as many existing trees as possible as stated on page 38 of the Southwest Community Comprehensive Plan. Uh, 
Removing almost all of these trees will significantly impact the tree canopy in Southwest Boise. It will destroy bird and wildlife habitat, reduce shade, increase temperature, and remove soil, soil stabilization provide, providing, provided by root systems. Although the developer has agreed to plant two trees per lot, most of the 150 or so mature trees are to be removed and they should, re should be replaced with trees of substantial size. A lot of HOAs in the area require at least three inch caliper trees in their common areas. Additionally, the staff states that the trees along the south property line will not, re not be removed by the developer. However, there needs to be some sort of protection so that the new homeowners will not remove those, lot, those trees once they move into the new homes. Uh, the condition needs to, needs to transfer to the new, new homeowners somehow and it needs to be enforceable. The laterals. NAs in other areas of Boise have spent a lot of time in public hearings speaking about the importance of keeping laterals daylighted. Boise is spending time and money to open up waterways that were buried long ago. Laterals create microclimates for living things, watering holes for wildlife, preserve the agricultural history of the area, and maintain the rural characteristics of Southwest Boise, which is discussed in depth in Blueprint Boise. SWACA requests that the laterals remain open. As for the historic houses, the two houses currently at 9933 are unique and historic to Southwest Boise. Obviously not as old as houses in other parts of town, but Southwest Boise has seen a lot of erasing of our history over the last few years with the demolition of barns, original farmhouses, tiling of laterals, and bulldozing, bulldozing of farmlands. Southwest Boise will never see the level of historic significance, at least in age, as other parts of town, if we continue to allow our unique original properties to be torn down at the current rate. These two houses were built by twin sisters, Eileen Schreier and Elaine Allen, with architect brothers Art Noel and Lyle Cook. They were built using local, locally sourced building materials, some of which the sisters collected themselves. Um, I included several articles about that in the, uh, the letter that SWACA provided. These houses do not enjoy any historical preservation since they are not in a historical district. However, that doesn't mean that something cannot be done to protect and preserve them and incorporate them into the current development, particularly with the question of annexation and rezone. The current owner has expressed to SWACA that saving the houses would financially impact how much money he could make off the land sale. Swaco was told by another neighbor that he would rather see the houses burn to the ground before they, were, they stay. A few developers that have built subdivisions in Swaka have kept the original houses, designed new subdivisions around them, fixed them up, refurbished them, added on if needed, and sold them. It can be done if there is a will and a desire to do it. I put examples of those farmhouses in our letter also. Boise City Council has set a precedent, precedent of protecting houses that are not within historic districts when they passed an emergency ordinance in the summer of 2018 to prevent the demolition of a house on the corner of Main and Second. We are asking for the same consideration for the history of Southwest Boise. Um, the remainder of my time, I'm going to give to my board member, Jill Longhurst. Thank you, committee. I appreciate your time and I appreciate your willingness to consider um, our concerns about this. We all recognize that Boise has some unique character. We hear about the foothills, we hear about Hyde Park, we hear about the Green Belt, but those of us who live in Southwest Boise consider that our own little gem and we don't talk about it because we like it the way it is. There is a beautiful part of this community that is unique. It is agricultural in nature and those of us who live there treasure that unique aspect of it. Before I go any further though, um, as a matter of housekeeping, I heard the developer say that he'd made a make mistake in the application and he is now withdrawing his language about having three story homes. And I wanted to make sure that the record was clear on that, that he is in fact withdrawing that request for three story homes that was in the application. We can't answer questions at this time, but please put it on the record and hopefully it'll be addressed later for on. the record because it would be a shame for him to make that representation to you now and then come back later and say it was in my original application i think that the homeowners there would take a lot of comfort in knowing that that was actually made um, we have a brief powerpoint that i'd like to talk about do you know how to start it as a powerpoint can i assist mr holmes for just there you go let me give it a click so this started out with when we started as a neighborhood group meeting and talking about our concerns about this. Can you get more? And we were talking about what the actual requests were. 
and Mr. Holmes, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to click a little faster through this. This part was originally set up for me to talk through it. Um, and again, we're, we are concerned about the public hearing um, on this. They're looking for basically a planned community, um, sorry, planned yeah. community variances. They wanted a change in zoning and they wanted annexation to Boise from what is at this point in the Ada County property with a significant number of homes for the property. Um, to start with, um, I, I am concerned about the public hearing. Mr. Dungley, who obviously has an interest in being here as well as myself as a, as a board member, we're both here and we walked around the entirety of the building trying to find our way in. If these two people who have a concerned and very focused interest in being here today couldn't find their way in until a period of time had passed, it concerns me that other people who have an interest can't also be here and make record um, as a public, to a public hearing in open meeting format. Um, there is a provision within the Boise City Code that would allow you, without further notice, to continue this. And I'm asking the court, or excuse me, the committee to do this at this time so that people who do have an interest, and we know that there are a lot of people who have concerns, we have a very large um, petition that has been signed, have an opportunity to be heard on this and they don't have to wor worry about their health risks or technology that they don't have access to or the ability to handle. And so I'm asking the court to or the committee to consider that as well. Here's the other part I'd like you to actually take a specific um, consideration of. You are a quasi-judicial uh, entity. As I understand that, having practiced law for 30 years, this means you can make factual findings. I looked through the Boise City Code and I found that they have already made factual findings on behalf of the city of Boise regarding mature trees. Um, and I cited these just because it's easy reference for you. Okay, next. Um, they talked about establishing maintaining the maximum amount of canopy coverage provided by trees for their functions as identified as part of this. Um, and part of this that I thought was really relevant is that the development practice were to encourage site and utility planning, building and development practices to prevent indiscriminate removal or destruction of trees and avoid unnecessary disturbance uh, to trees within the city and area of impact. Next. Comprehensive plan is to implement the goals and objectives of the city comprehensive plan relating to the trees. And finally, there were findings, and I'm sorry that apparently I've got A mixed up, aesthetic value, protection costs, property values, air and water quality, reduction of ad adverse impacts, and wildlife. For example, all of us who live, as I do, along this, uh, the northern border of Rome Meadows, we look out over their trees all the time, including my own very large maple tree. There are birds of prey flying through there. We see fox. There was a wild turkey on my front porch recently. We have peacocks that are on the land at this time. Skunk, um, there are, there's one of our neighbors looking at um, a heron, a blue heron a rookery um, issue that's concerning this property. We have a tremendous amount of wildlife. The reduction of all these trees, not just the ones along the southern border of this property, has an impact in the entirety, excuse me, in the entirety of this area here. And I think that there has been no study and no consideration of that. And as um, member of the board has already, excuse me, the chairman of the board has already told you, there is no protection for any of us. If the developer doesn't remove them, there's no way to keep us from doing that. Um, for me personally, I have concerns about this because I know of an existing erosion issue that is not being addressed by any of the plans. Right now, this is the, the proposed development here. Can you, oh, one more, oh, one more. If you look here, um, the, the two green lines there show where there are irrigation lines that currently are active. They were active as late as last Thursday when my own line was running. My neighbor and I, my property is the one um, with the red lines near it, that our water runs uphill for us to do our flood irrigation. There is a group a grove of trees, as you can see there, that were planted for soil stabilization. It keeps the water, because this is on a grade running downhill toward the property that's proposed, it keeps it from running away. There are a number of these trees that are planted along laterals and other places with very developed root system, developed plant canopies that are meant there to keep the, the soil stable. I have not seen anything that is going to tell us what exactly is going to go on. When my property um, lets the water go over onto either side, there has been no um, identification of what the irrigation problem is, how they're gonna mitigate that or what the concern is. If you look where the red arrows are, sorry, I have to turn my head so I can see that. 
Sorry, we need you on the mic again, Sorry. just so it's captured for the record. And um, if you can throw your name and address in there too, for the record. Uh, Jill start. Longhurst, 9900 Rome Meadows. If you look, um, my property after flood irrigation goes downhill. It goes under my neighbor's property, which is on Rome Meadows. Mr. Aaron's property, which is part of the subject of this land, also goes to the neighbor's property and then goes off to another lateral and goes down. There's already been litigation we've retained counsel we've had problems with this because the, the neighbor has modified where the uh, lateral goes in where the water egresses and there has been erosion issues that have been greatly concerning to mr arian and myself that matter has not been addressed if you look to the side this is google maps this is nothing that any one of you couldn't do mr landon's property is flooding he attributes it to several things there has been a hydrologist study related to this, one of the suggestions is that the Diamante subdivision, which is directly across Mitchell from here, was not properly uh, drained as it comes down Mitchell, and that's causing the flooding issue. I don't know how this committee could say that this is not going to create adverse property problems to all of the Rome Meadows people when we already see that this is going on. So I was looking through the requirements of Idaho code uh, it said the irrigation system must be approved by the city council or by the planning and zoning committee. I, this isn't, there are remedies if it wasn't done in time, but it doesn't say if you feel like it. It basically said we need to have clarification and details in order for us to approve that. I haven't seen anything that allows me to make a decision or to retain somebody to make a decision on my behalf who is an expert that this isn't going to cause problems for me the way this has been proposed. The city code itself talks about all natural drainage courses shall be left undisturbed or be improved in a manner that will improve the hydraulics. I haven't seen anything other than we're gonna take care of that. I think we as neighbors to this property have a right to know how are we going to address this? Will this actually be an improvement or is this going to be something that's going to be, we're gonna spend as little money as possible we're going to get this resolved. We're going to get a lot of people in these houses and we're going to move. I think we have no uh, the ability to know. And this council can require an easement under the Boise City Code that would prevent this from becoming a future problem and allow us to retain the farmer's laterals to keep them open or whatever we need to do relating to that. Thank you. That's your time. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now we will move on to questions from the commission for the neighborhood, the staff, or the applicant, please. Madam Chair. Com Commissioner Squires. Hi. Um, this question is for staff. Kevin, can you talk to the irrigation issue and when that review will happen with the city? So that way the neighbors have some sort of clue as to what that timing might be. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Squires. Um, so the, the irrigation um, requirements are, are reviewed under the Boise Project Board of Control. And so we do have a letter that is included in the project uh, report as a condition. Um, that they have to, to follow all of their requirements. And it does state that um, all drainage and existing irrigation uh, facilities do have to be maintained. And if an easement needs to be put in place, it needs to be put in place. So um, from staff's perspective, that should cover um, some of those concerns. Follow up, Mr. Follow up, Madam Chairman. Yeah, Commissioner Squires, please. Uh, so Kevin, that would occur typically with the final plot? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Squires, this would occur through the through the both of the plotting processes. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman, Commissioner Gillespie. Just a follow up on Commissioner Squires' question. So, um, would so obviously the grading of the site has is very important for the drainage and irrigation plan. So, this is just a procedural question. So, does the city have to approve and deal with these issues before or after? the issuance of a grading permit? Because how do they do it if they don't have a grading permit, I guess is my question. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Gillespie, it's my understanding that um, after the preliminary plat uh, process would be approved, they would submit for uh, grading or drainage um, per or 
permits related to grading and drainage. Um, at that point in time, um, both city staff would review it um, as well as uh, irrigation facility uh, um, entities. Great, thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Bratnober. Uh, another question on irrigation. As I understand it, um, there is some level of approval that is needed from whoever the responsible person is, which is defined as um, ditch company, water users association, water right holder, et cetera. Do you know if this has been done, Kevin? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Ratnober, um, typically these things are done after the preliminary plat has been approved. Um, the uh, applicant will then submit uh, a plans for review to the, you know, for example, uh, lateral associations for their review and approval. So that would happen before any planned unit development, subdivision, any of those kinds of things happen or applications happen. Correct. That, that would happen before a, a final, final plat um, and or any construction permits are issued. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bratnober. I have a, another set of questions on a, a different topic. So as I look at the lot sizes and compare them to the surroundings, um, at the north you have some that are, what is it, seven to 10,000? Actually, it's closer to 8,000 as the minimum as, I, as I've done some checking on those. Um, and then half, half acre south. I, I'm trying to understand, we have a, an R1B zoning proposal, but if you look at a substantial number of those lots, their sizes and some of the setbacks really tend to approximate um, what you'd see in an R1C subdivision. So I'm wondering if there's a, I don't know, a structural reason or something why those units have to be packed that densely, uh, basically um, contrary to, to the surroundings, um, short of, well, we, need, we want to accommodate this many units. Um, I'm curious as to why they're not going with something that at least comes in at the 9,000 square foot R1B specification and the associated setbacks. Madam Chair, this is Heath Clark, again, 251 East Front Street. So the, the thought process there, Commissioner Bradenover, really focuses a lot on the fact that this is not in the middle of large lot in a sea of, of half acre or one acre lots. Um, there are some larger lots on the south in an older subdivision, but this is a project that is, is truly, it is at the intersection of the large lot and the suburban densities right along Victory Road. And the lots immediately across the street are very similar in size here. So the idea was to, to, to have a, a project that is in fill that does try to transition away from the, the larger lots on the south to the arterial and the, 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 other, the smaller lots on the north. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Madam Chair? Commissioner Bradnober. Uh, but as I look at it, the proposal for many of those lots is 5,000 square feet. Whereas when you look to the north, um, I believe there are some that come in around 7,900, but most of them are above 8,000. So um, there's not really a match in that regard. You're going from approximately 8,000, eight to 10,000, let's say seven to 10,000 down to five and then back up to very large lots. That does not seem to jive. Thank you. Madam Chair, Commissioner Bradnober, I think uh, what you're describing north of Victory Road is essentially what we're talking about here as well. Those lots get larger as they move away from Victory Road. They get smaller as they get closer to the transportation corridors. And we're trying to accomplish the same thing. Uh, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bratnober. Un understood. But when I did checking on those lots, they came in pretty close to 8,000 feet. Um, and many of them were over 8,000 feet. So, and those are the lots close to, what is it, Victory Road there. Um, so I just want that to be noted. Thank you. Madam Chairman. 
Commissioner Gillespie. So, so just to follow up on what Jim is talking about, I guess the simplest way to phrase it uh, for the city, just to answer Kevin is, um, you know, they've asked for R1B zoning. I think R1B zoning is appropriate. Um, it's a good transition match. So then the question I think Jim is trying to get to is, why don't we just stick to the R1B zoning requirements for lot size for all the lots in this subdivision, which would make, you know, so, which should probably reduce somewhat some of that. It would reduce the number of lots because the lots in the very center of it are, are you know, not conforming to the R1B street frontage. And I don't know, I don't know the dimensional standard, but you get the point is, why don't we just stick with, okay, you can have all R1B zoning for the whole property, but you have to stick to the R1B setback and size requirements. What's this, what's the city's, why is it in the public interest not to do that, I guess? Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Gillespie, um, well, that certainly would be within your discretion. Um, the, the ability to retain some of the, um, for example, the, the open pond feature in the middle with open space um, is, is part of the, the PUD request, which goes along with those reduced um, dimensional standards. Um, so so that, for, for, for Commissioner Bratnober and everybody, so. Commissioner Glatzby. Thank you. What I think, what Kevin is really trying to say is in this case, the answer is the public, the public interest is being served and we're trading so the, some smaller lots to preserve that pond because, and the trees and, you know, whatever else. So that's the public interest uh, weighing that's being done here. Because as I understand the law, Kevin, I mean, the applicant would be within their rights to eliminate that pond and, elim you know, all the trees. They, I mean, there's no requirement that they keep those amenities. Those amenities are there in order to compensate for having these substandard R1B lots. If that, that's the trade-off, Jim, that I think is being made. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Would the city agree with that? Let me see. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Gillespie, the, the, I would agree with those statements, yes. Commissioner Stevens. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of things, um, just to, and, and Kevin, I'm going to ask you to confirm this, but <clears throat> just because even if the commission decides to zone the whole thing R1B and maintain the dimensional standards doesn't mean that the um, applicant can just wholesale wipe out that pond. We still, they still have to meet um, because they're being annexed because there's also an annexation and a, and a rezone. They also need to meet um, a set of findings for that. So I don't want us, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't I, am I right, Kevin? Uh, Commissioner, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, you are correct. Yes, there are other applications that would have mm -hmm. those. Okay, so I just, I mean, I don't want anybody on the commission to think that we, you know, we save the pond by doing what's in front of us today or we lose the pond. I think it's not that, not that black and white. Um, and then I guess um, at a very basic level, I just wanted to confirm for the record, Kevin, that um, in our comp plan, I wanted to have you tell us what large lot means. Um, I know that the Neighborhood Association um, told us from their reading of the comp plan, but I just wanted to confirm that for the record. So can you tell us what large lot means and that designation in, in the comp plan for this property? Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Stevens, there, there's uh, a, you know, a whole table that goes into the, the standards that go along with um, large lot. I think in, in the case of an annexation like this, one of the first things that we look at is the zonings that are appropriate um, that go along with it, one of which is the, R, the requested R1B zoning designation. Um, so just to clarify and confirm then, a 9,000 square foot lot as is um, defined in R1B does qualify under what's called large lot because <clears throat> it is one of the zones that's, that's permitted in that large lot designation, correct? Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, you are correct. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, may I um, pursue a different line of questioning? Please. Okay. Um, this is also for staff. Kevin, um, with regard to the sidewalks, um, if we do follow staff's recommendation and 
uh, require detached sidewalks, won't that inherently reduce the size of the lots even further? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, it does have the potential to do that. Um, the, the, the right of way width could increase. Um, on, on the other hand, the sidewalks could be uh, included within an easement um, along the right of way um, as well. Okay. Um, and Madam Chair, I don't. I, I may as well get through a few of them since um, I'm on. If that's okay with you. Yes, please, Commissioner Stevens. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to um, ask about. Uh, couple of other things. I just wanted to understand with regard to traffic um, and get this on the record. Right now, Victory Road is already um, beyond what ACHD considers to be acceptable. Um, is the reason that they and the city are um, recommending approval of this because there is no egress onto, ingress or egress onto Victory Road from this, and so we're really only looking at Mitchell? And if so, then why does Victory show up in our table and why are we looking at that? <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, um, I, I don't wanna speak for ACHD, but I can try to interpret um, what I've also read in their staff report. Um, the, the Mitchell Street access is you know, um, the only access that ACHD will allow. And we do look at Victory because it will be impacted. Um, and, they, and they mention in their staff report, ACHD does, that um, Victory is already over capacity, as you said. Um, but it is within their policies that this would have a low enough amount of uh, impact during the peak uh, traffic time that they are allowed to approve it. Um, and now, while they don't say this directly in their um, project report, it is worth noting that Victory is planned on being widened uh, in the relative new, near future um, within the, the 2021 to 2025 timeframe. And then at that point in time, it will become a five lane uh, with a turn lane. Uh, so four lanes, turn lane and bike lanes as well. Um, so that could have some impact into why um, they feel comfortable approving this under their policies. Okay, so totally unfair question to you <laughs> because you probably, you may not know the answer. But is um, ACHD on track right now with the uh, COVID and everything? Um, has any has anything changed in their in their capital improvement plan? And again, totally unfair question to you because you don't work for them. But maybe you know. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, I personally have not heard any uh, disruptions. And in fact, some of their projects have been moving forward a little bit quicker because there is less traffic to deal with as they <laughs> do their work. Okay. Okay. And then Madam Chair, I just have one other line of questioning if, um, but I'm happy to let somebody else go first if. That's okay, Commissioner Stevens, go ahead. Okay, um, with regard to the addition of a condition for a tree mitigation plan, um, I was just hoping that you, Kevin, could explain what would be, uh, how staff would look at that and what the findings are um, that would permit approval of that. So like when staff looks at a tree mitigation plan, what are they looking at to say yes or no? Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, um, typically when we look at a tree mitigation plan, we'll look at caliper inches. In, in this case, I think we know, and there is no requirement with these applications to match caliper inches to caliper inches. Um, in, in this case, we've reviewed the information that the applicant has provided to us for the estimated amount of trees to be removed and the estimated amount of new trees. And it sounds like the, that equation has actually gotten better um, just in the time that we've packaged this report and today. Um, so from our perspective, um, we would look at any tree mitigation that plan that came through and just kind of use that as a trust but verify mechanism for the information that we already have. Thank you. I actually have a quick tree question if I can scoot it in. Um, can we speak specifically to the idea of requiring homeowners to keep the trees on the property? Is that something that has you in your recollection has been done before or is something that's within our jurisdiction? Madam Chair, um, I, I've never run across anything where we've been able to as a, as a municipality to restrict the homeowner's ability to, to trim their own trees on their private property. Uh, theoretically, something like that could be included in a CCNRs, for example. 
um, but that would be a little bit outside of the, the preview, even though we do typically review what goes into a CCR. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. Just a point of clarification with staff too on the tree mitigation plan. Uh, in addition to caliper inches, which is certainly part of the study, you also take a look at species, health, uh, and if there are any historic or significant trees on the property that are worth saving. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Schaefer, that is correct, yes. Okay, thanks. And I, uh, Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. There's one other follow-up point um, earlier on the conversation regarding uh, the irrigation. Um, I think there might have been some confusion uh, regarding the applicant and whether or not they've already spoken with some of the appropriate agencies and there is correspondence. So I just want the record to be clear that the applicant has spoken uh, with Nampa Marine Irrigation District in regards to the lateral on the property. So that conversation already has already begun, correct? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Schaefer, they have, uh, yes, there's correspondence in there with Nampa Meridian Irrigation District, even though they are solely responsible for the farmer's lateral, which is in that northern part of that property. Okay, okay, thanks. Madam Chair. Commissioner Bratnober. Uh, thank you. So uh, thanks to Commissioner Gillespie and Commissioner Stevens uh, for accurately summarizing what I was going to say or what I was trying to say. So with respect to the signal warn analysis, uh, this is for Kevin. Um, I noticed that that was done in 2017 um, and a lot has gone by. And plus we're talking about a fairly significant um, development going in. Is it your feeling that that's valid and up to date um, in terms of the signal needs? It's, let's see, it's the Victory Road and Mitchell uh, analysis. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner Bratnover, I don't really feel comfortable questioning the ACHD staff and their expertise with, with regards to their staff report. Okay, but they gave no indication that, gee, this should be updated or anything like that. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, Commissioner Bratnover, no. Madam Chair, if I might be able to add something to that. Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Clark. And without uh, also, like Kevin, I'm, I'm loath to to uh, speak for ACHD, but the report does indicate that that was revisited again in 2018 with regard to a pedestrian crossing at the intersection, and ACHD indicated that they will continue to monitor that. So I'm I'm comfortable with uh, with you know we want to see a, a, an intersection that functions for our residents. You know we're we're that's not something that we uh, look at lightly, and so we're 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 confident in in the steps that ACHD has taken on that front. Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. I have a question for the folks from um, the Neighborhood Association for Marissa and Jill. I'll wait till you. So um, you, you both testified that the, the simple number, the density itself, you didn't think was compatible or that would create a hardship. Um, and that you both wanted a R, or the Jill wanted an R1A zone and a 20,000 square feet minimum. What exactly is the hardship or the, the, the difficulty of having R1B lots or the lots size that they've proposed? I, I'm not, I don't quite understand. How does that adversely affect the neighbors having more houses on that piece of property? Commissioner, are you addressing that to me or to Marissa? Either one of you. Both of us. I'll, I can state my opinion and you can state yours. Um, I think that there are a number of reasons for that. One is just an increase in the number of people that are coming to a neighborhood that's traditionally been rural. More kids in the schools, more cars on the streets. It's not an area that is walkable. It's not bikeable. Everybody's going to be driving a car. The other issue is when you have go from one backyard neighbor or two backyard neighbors in the case of the Dunkley house and Mr. Arian's house. And now all of a sudden you have 14 back neighbors. It does um, cause some issues as far as privacy. And these are still rural areas. They are farming areas. They have egg animals, they have roosters, they have cows, they butcher on their property. And having the, the, an increase of people that perhaps are not used to that sort of thing or not as tolerant of that can cause difficulties for the people that live there. I myself have had phone calls from, from people asking when 
when the neighborhood association is going to get rid of the cows in the subdivision next door or next door to a subdivision out um, in the area of impact because they don't like the flies that the cows bring to the neighborhood. And so it does, there is, it does cause friction that way. Do you have any further? And additionally, I, I would say those of us. Uh, sorry, if you can just start with your name again. I'm sorry, Jill Longhurst again. Um, Isha and I uh, both have had horses while we've been on these properties. A number of those places have had horses and we're asking to abut to three different neighbors that have these tiny, tiny lots. When you say that they're, they are similar nature, they're not. Those are significantly smaller lots than even those on the other side, which are in Boise City in the Carolina Place subdivision. They're smaller than the Diamante lot that was only recently approved by the city. And they're smaller than everything that we're talking about going to the, the south and to the west. Um, so we're talking about essentially three houses to the back of my one lot um, and my, my narrow long acre, acreage lot. In addition to that, I have for more than 20 years turned on to Mitchell Street and then right on to Victory to get to work. I am now at the point where I'm waiting for four or five or six cars to find a way to get to Victory, which is overflown and flooded. And you're asking between my house on Run Meadows and Victory Road for another 67, 68 homes, which could be two homes with cars or teenagers or whomever else drives. So there could be much more than two or three cars per home already getting there before me. I'm already having struggles to get onto victory. And you're asking to add that many additional lot. That density is just simply not sufficient for this area. This is a much more densely populated area. And it does not fairly compare when you say they're similarly sized. They're not. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Stevens. This is another question for Kevin. Um, I wanted to go back to the lot size, large lot um, designation and ask if, um, if we as a commission um, approve a subdivision whose lots are almost half that size, um, do we still comply with the comp plan? Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, um, in many ways we still do. Um, the comp plan is a guiding document and we do have the PUD process on the books to make um, exceptions for um, what maybe you would find in the comp plan or, or dimensional standards and code. So it stands to reason that the, the PUD process is the appropriate manner to which if you were going to um, go against the guidance, maybe not go against, but uh, uh, deviate from the guidance of the comprehensive plan, this, this is the appropriate manner to do so. Madam Chair, could I add to that? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Clark. Yeah, and, and Madam Chair and Commissioner Stevens, the, the, just the points that I would emphasize there is that R1B is certainly, it's explicitly an approved zone within the large lot designation. And you can get up to 4.8 units per acre within R1B, we're at 3.61. Um, the, and and I, I do wanna emphasize that the PUD process, and I was gonna jump in earlier and maybe I'll just make this point now. The, the PUD process is by definition there to allow for some creativity to preserve or to create different and amenities that might not be able to be preserved otherwise. So in this case, it, it, the, the, the use of the PUD allows us to, to move those lots around and allow for preservation of that pond and create another amenity while we're still in, I think, substantial conformance with the, the lot sizes to our north. So just a couple extra thoughts there. Thank you. Madam Chairman, Commissioner Gillespie, just so just back on the lot size. So all the there's 14 lots along the southern boundary. That, is that correct? That it, Madam Chair, Commissioner and, Gillespie, that is correct. And do each of those lots conform to the RMB, R1B size requirements? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Gillespie, uh, they do except for in one regard, which would be the requested interior side setbacks, um, which depending on uh, there's a, an added recommended added condition in there um, that if the uh, homes built on those 14 lots utilize less than the 10 foot interior side setback that is typical of R1B that they be limited to one story in height. 
Um, the, origi the applicant originally uh, asked for uh, all homes to, uh, regardless of story size, um, to be able to utilize the, the reduced five foot setback. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. Uh, this might be a question. I'm going to throw this question at the applicant. Uh, along that same area, you're proposing to keep the existing trees along that southern uh, boundary line. Do you have an estimate on the height of those existing trees? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Schaefer, I don't have an ex exact height, but let me I have a slide that I used in my presentation that might help illustrate that. So let me pull that up. So they, they are not insignificant. Um, you, this is the overhead using Google Earth, looking at about a 45 degree angle back at, at the shops at, uh, and, and many of which are two, uh, excuse me, two stories. So they're, they're, they're fairly significant trees. Um, as part of our study, we will be looking at, you know, ensuring that we can make uh, make sure that those uh, remain healthy. Uh, you know, a lot of the trees throughout the project, uh, you know, maybe meeting nearing the end of their life cycle, but we expect to preserve those. Um, and let's see, you know, with I, I, I think it would be good for me to just jump in real quick on that issue of uh, private CCNR and, and requiring individuals, individual homeowners to maintain. I, I think that would be pretty difficult. Um, we can, I, I hit personally draft CCNRs all over the valley. Uh, I, I've never seen an example of a CCNR that said that someone can't cut down a, a tree if it's diseased or aged. And so I, I see that as being difficult, but this applicant is committed to uh, in, uh, preserving those trees on that south boundary line. Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. Heath, uh, just to follow up on that, just sort of yeah. to brainstorm, what about, is it possible, or would you consider putting like a 10 or 15 foot landscape buffer, that buffer where those trees are, into a common lot that the HOA would then maintain? So you got it, a, you know, that, that those trees and that we're in a long, narrow common lot across the, I don't know if you can see me, Heath, so I'm just doing this for that, <laughs> um, you know, so that the, the trees, in a sense, became uh, an amenity or, a, you know, a, like the HOA common area that they maintain. So then the, the CCNRs could provide for the, you know, the ongoing maintenance of that buffer, which I think is pretty important to some of those folks to the south. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, or Madam Chair, Commissioner Gillespie, um, you know, certainly open to considering the various alternatives as, as we're just kind of spitballing right now. Um, some of the things that I could see as being, uh, having a, being difficult to overcome would be that, you know, how wide would that common lot be in order to make sure that it can be, you know, patrolled safely and maintained by the HOA. And then you're shrinking up the, the lots at that point on the other side of them. So, um, and, you know, and, it, and then we've got 30 yard, 30 foot rear yard setbacks as well. So that's shrinking those lots pretty significantly. And if we're thinking about transitions, you know, I, granted, I, I see that your point that that does have so serve a, a dual purpose of also being a transition, but it would, it would generally shrink up those lots pretty significantly. And I think create some, some maintenance headache for the HOA because those are large trees. If they have to be felled, that's a pretty narrow area to do it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Madam oh, Chair. Oh, Commissioner Stevens. Hi, I had a question for um, Heath and Mr. Conger. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about laterals in the valley over the last several years. Um, and the, you know, there's definitely a move by not just Boise, but kind of all over the country to daylight um, these 
facilities that have been buried for, you know, over a hundred years. And I'm just curious, um, I mean, you know, the, the location of this particular lateral is obviously right smack through the middle of several of the lots that you have platted. But um, I'm just wondering if you, if, if you and or the applicant has given any, any thought to how you might um, keep some of it daylighted. I don't know that you can keep the whole thing daylighted and keep the, um, keep, you know, a, a subdivision there, but um, have you, have you considered any of that when you read the, um, the concerns of the neighbors, um, you know, what kind of discussions happened um, offline that, that you can share with us when you talked about that? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner Stevens. So um, I have, pre we, we prepared a slide because we have been thinking about this issue. So the slide that you have on your screen, the area that has the red hashing is the portion of the farmer's lateral that is already uh, tiled or covered up. Um, it was covered up on, on this property uh, within the last five or 10 years. Is that right? Um, so the area that would be covered up is the area only here on the, on the Dunkley property on the west side. So it's only about 400 feet. It is not daylighted. Um, you know, it, it obviously, I think it goes back across Victory at that point and is covered as well. So, um, no, we get, and, and, I, and I understand where you're coming from, Commissioner Stevens. The thought process was, you know, the, the best way to have that type of amenity was to preserve the pond. Um, the pond is not fed by the lateral, it's fed by drainage, it's fed by other surface rights. So we're, we're confident that we can do that. Um, and we, we would intend to, to, to go with that approach to address the, the concern that you've raised. Madam Chair. Commissioner uh, Schaefer. Uh, this is for the uh, applicant. Heath, to follow up on that line of questioning, um, the Neighborhood Association brought up several concerns regarding grades and drainage along that south property line as well. Can you give us some insight into conversations you've had regarding, to the, regarding those problems and how you guys intend to address some of those issues? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Schaefer, so as, as you're probably aware, um, you know, with reg when we do any of these projects, and when I say we, I mean anyone in the development community, um, there is a requirement of a grading and drainage plan that has to be done. And usually that start, that process, the grading process can start after a pre-plat. Um, we will have to go through and specifically look at any of those issues. And I expect that, you know, based on the fact that this has probably not been engineered before, that any of those issues will be addressed through that process. And we, you know, we work regularly with public works on that and we expect that that'll be taken care of. Any final questions from the commission? Okay, um, we will now move on to the public testimony. Um, a couple of housekeeping items for people here in person. There are wipes up here, so feel free to wipe down the podium if you'd like to. Um, you're also welcome to remove your mask while you're speaking if that's helpful for you. Um, and then we'll start with everybody in this room that would like to speak before we move on to the virtual attendees. Um, for everybody, please start with your name and address and each person will have three minutes. Um, we'll start first with, I'll read the first three or four people. And so if we can keep it moving with the people in the room, um, either move up to one of the front seats if you're not, um, so we can keep things moving along. So first up will be Julianne and then Misty Daniels and then Tracy, and then Ted Price. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Julianne Shaw. I live at 9950 West Roan Meadows Drive. The one thing that we need to be aware of with the trees, we all love the trees, is that they're fed by an irrigation 
lateral, well, ditch, or, well, I guess it's just a surface ditch. Death needs to continue. If the waters stop, the trees will die. We have parallel um, surface ditches uh, on the north side and the south side of that fence line and that tree line. So that's something. I mean, yes, retain the trees, but don't stop the water. Or there's no point. Another thing I'd like to point out is I've been working with Idaho Fish and Game in regards to the wildlife there. Uh, it's not, does, that area is not designated as a great blue heron rookery, but we've had great blue herons there for 30 years. It's beautiful watching them come in over that tree line. Also, the uh, tree line is a landmark for the airport. When, in 1990, when the Blue Angels were here, they used that tree line as a landmark to turn uh, and land. It was pretty cool seeing them come over those trees. Okay, the single level home suggested on the 14 southern lots is backward. They can build a three story or four story or whatever the heck they want to if they're farther than 10 feet from the property line. If they're less than 10 feet from the property line, they have to be a single story. It's kind of written backwards. It's not cognitive. Uh, the point being that all the surrounding areas have single level ranch-like um, development. They were made for ranchettes to be able to have your cow. We still have folks who have cows back there and they're butchered back there. So you've got to keep in mind the agricultural aspect and the residential aspect. And it's not that we don't want people coming and enjoying that area, we do, but we don't want them getting upset because somebody butchered their cow in the backyard. It's part of that integration. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Misty Daniels, followed by Tracy Price. Good evening, Madam Commissioner, Commissioners. Um, first of all, Misty Daniels. Um, I live at 9957 Roan Meadows Drive, and I want to thank you all for hearing our comments tonight. Um, I have destroyed my notes because everyone's talked about everything I wanted to talk about. Um, but I did notice some, some key points that I just wanted to bring out. Um, a little introduction of myself. Um, my husband and I have lived here for 22 years. We moved here from a big city. Uh, asphalt, concrete, buildings, stagnant heat. That's what happens when you take out all of the um, open water and put in asphalt and concrete. Um, we moved to Boise uh, because it is one of the most popular. It is one of the most popular cities to live in in the nation because of its diversity, and that's what brought my husband and I here. Um, it's diversity in activities, climates, and housing options. We have the beautiful North End to downtown Boise, Southeast Boise, and the semi-rural and rural areas. The diversity diversity is precisely what brings new families to our great city. We need to work to keep. Boise's properties diverse. The developer states in his application under justification that Boise is changing rapidly and this area has a need for additional housing. With that in mind, the proximity to services makes this, prime, this area prime for single family residential development. I do agree that Boise is growing and it's continuing to grow. However, it is the responsibility of the citizens of Idaho and the Planning and Zoning Commission to mindfully review the growth. Currently, there are many lots, as stated previously, that are not built on, sitting empty. I think we need to start building on the empty lots instead of continuing to approve the demolition of these beautiful lots that we have. We need to start focusing on smart growth for Boise, including a range of housing opportunities for our current and new residents we have a lot of, our, lot of diversity in our neighborhoods, including, as I said, the North End, Southeast Boise, and our semi-rural and rural areas. It is important that we keep the diversity of Idaho available for those who are moving here for exactly that reason. Um, the application reads, and uh, the application read 3.7 houses per acre. Um, I believe the the gentleman stated it was 3.61 houses per acre, but if you actually base the number of houses on the lot sizes and not the streets, the common areas, the sidewalks, you are actually looking at 5.5 houses per acre. 
if you look at the um, overhead map shown of the density of that area, as has been a concern, I think brought up with many questions from the commissioners, you can see that it does not transition well. Victory Road plays a great segue into the uh, more dense areas across Victory, as opposed to the semi-rural area on the other side of Victory. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Next, we have Tracy Price, followed by Ted Price, and then Darren Daniels. Okay, you got your pictures up there. My name is Tracy Price, and I'm at 9901 West Roan Meadows Drive. And Madam Chair and Commissioners, um, I want you to know that I've agreed with what's already been said by my neighbors and also SWACA. I would like to address how this new subdivision will adversely affect my semi-rural lifestyle. Um, not too long ago, I witnessed the birth of a foal, and there's a video, if we can get to the video that says foal, video, and there's pictures of various different animals and the lifestyle of where we currently live at. Um, I also raise a beef cow every year, and the mobile butcher comes to get the steer each fall. I love this unique area because of the rural lifestyle within the city county limits. I see all sorts of wildlife, including ducks, geese, turkeys, blue herons, rabbits, and even skunks. My neighbors even have horses, pigs, burros, and other animals, goats included. I love seeing my neighbors ride the horses down our street, but that has decreased significantly with the increase of traffic and the high density neighborhoods going in around us. I would also like to address um, traffic concerns, and I think there's some pictures there of traffic. Um, that would adversely affect me because of the proposed increased density housing since I live on Rowan Meadows Drive. With increasing density as proposed by the music subdivision, it would greatly increase the traffic on Mitchell to get to the congested Victory Road. Traffic on Mitchell increased when Arabian Way connected to Mitchell Street and then the Diamante subdivision. And there's the traf photos of the traffic, so like 5 to 6 p.m. This new subdivision would only increase the traffic further, and I'm specifically concerned by what Daryl DeGrange stated in the project report, which is that in order for those who that need to make a left-hand turn to go onto westbound, westbound on Victory Road, the drivers would need to divert off of Mitchell Street and travel down Roan Meadows to get to Five Mile, creating as much as 300 vehicles in a 10-hour period, which would greatly affect my lifestyle. Um, ACHD also when I called and talked to them about getting a study they said that since the subdivision was like under a hundred homes that it does, did not designate needing to check that but they also included the other three the subdivisions that went in they were all under a hundred homes so there's not been a recent study done with the cumulative effect of all those subdivisions finally I'd like to address the inconsistencies within the music subdivision proposal and in the project report that would affect my lifestyle because the homes may not be similar or compatible. They state that the type of homes would be compatible for the area, but they are comparing the homes all the way across the large high traffic road of victory, not the areas closest to the impact and they are affected by that are affected by the proposed subdivision to me compatible means similar and of same mind. When music subdivision mentions that they will be providing a housing type that currently doesn't exist and one to three story homes, this is not compatible to our area. Our homes are all single level split entry or two levels, which may include a basement. And I've got pictures of homes as well in the area. Time. In the newest subdivision. Day Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. That's the end of your time. All right. Uh, next, we have Ted Price, followed by Darren Daniels. Thank you. Um, my name is Ted Price. I live at 9901 Roan Meadows Drive. Um, one of the concerns I have has been, been the trees and the stabilizing effect that the root systems are maintained there. If you look at those trees, those trees are not random. Those were put in there in a very specific pattern. And it's my opinion, I, don't, I wasn't there, I wasn't involved in the layout, but those trees were put in with a specific pattern in mind. That, that is not random whatsoever. And, and I just want to emphasize, while, while all, is, all works fine normally under these irrigation systems, I've lived there long enough to know that in the spring in particular, sometimes you get more water, sometimes you get less. And, and I just am concerned that that water is going to end up creating a impact to somebody and something that is not under a normal condition. One other thing I just want to go on record as saying is several years ago at the corner of Mitchell and Victory, 
on this property, there was a significant amount of infill brought in. Um, and while this is fine for the, it maintains the property flat where it's currently at, and, and I, haven't ever, I haven't ever measured that, that vertical height, but I'm assuming it's seven to 10 feet of vertical infill. And uh, I'm sure it's unconsolidated. I'm sure there's organic material underneath it. And while it's fine for cows, I just wanna say it's probably not so fine to build on without at least addressing the, uh, the, the, sta the stabilization of the soil. And I, I just wanna go on record and saying 3.61 units per acre that's 12,000 square feet per unit, per acre, or excuse me, 12,000 square feet per unit, not, not uh, 7,000 or 6,000 or whatever the numbers we're receiving. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Hello, commissioners, my name is Darren Daniels. I live at 9957 West Rome Meadows. And I agree with all the previous concerns that have been brought to us. And I also bring one other concern that reaches personally to me is uh, having worked for a, a large utility company here in the area, I do not express their views or opinions right now. These are mine alone. <laughs> I had to throw that out there. And anyways, uh, being a first responder for that, not just police, fire, but utility first response, traffic is terrible with ACHD reviewing and looking and saying project you know this project's not going to affect traffic this project's are they accumulating all these together and looking at the real impact as in Mrs. Price's picture shown I've experienced that for almost 20 years seeing that watching the, watching this town grow especially this area this area cannot handle a lot of small, large subdivisions, large number of houses without some infrastructure in better shape, better roads. They're, and as far as I know, there is not even a five-year plan yet on widening that section of victory yet. There is discussion, but there's no pre preliminary plans, not within a five-year timeline, as far as the utility company that I work for knows of. Also, I, uh, I'm totally having a brain freeze here. <laughs> so much has been said, I just wanna make sure I cover the other. But uh, that, is, that is my largest concern here with that impact for first responders and stuff like that. And I would say that growth is coming, yes. Those should be half acre lots, no smaller than that. Diamante subdivision has three accesses to it. It is not greatly impact this. Not a lot, a little, but not a lot. You put in 67 homes, one egress and entrance, you're gonna impact that area greatly and it's not gonna be handled. So I ask that you commissioners, please ponder on that one very thoroughly before making your decision. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Um, I think, is there anybody else here in person that would like to speak tonight? Please just come on up then. Yeah, go ahead, everybody that would like to. Yeah, one at a time. And Oh, you, I'm sorry, it's hard with all the masks. You spoke with- I spoke for the Neighborhood Association, but I'd like to take three minutes just for my personal testimony. Uh, yeah, that's fine, please go okay. ahead. Uh, Marissa Keith, 3279 South Cloverdale, Boise. Um, yesterday, well, Sunday, I don't know what today is. Sunday, um, I spent the day driving around Swaka to take inventory of the plats that had been approved and built for a project that another neighborhood association is working on with statesmen. Um, we included the uh, Balkan Crest, which is in CUNA, because all of those houses that they approved out there are gonna come into Boise, nobody goes to CUNA. We counted 5,200 lots that have been approved out in Southwest Boise, and we counted between 100 and 200 houses built. It's not an issue of lots not being available. It's an issue of the houses not being built in a timely manner. Um, as far as for the easement of the trees, I really do think it's just lip service. The developer is playing for these neighbors. If he's trying to get the development approved based on saving those trees and he has no actual plan to 
protect those trees once he is out of that subdivision and moved on to the next, then it's, it's kind of a waste of time to even discuss it at this point. There needs to be some sort of easement, there needs to be some sort of protection to make sure that those trees are, are there for the long term. Um, I spend a whole lot of my time down at ACHD, spend like hours of my life there every week just following along on what they're doing. And I have spoken with an old employee there several times. He calls, he has said that the people at ACHD refer to Southwest Boise as death by a thousand cuts. And what he means by that is that they, developers put in all of these small subdivisions that never meet the criteria for a traffic impact study, never meet the criteria for mitigation. And before you know it, it's just snowballed and, and now we have 5,200 houses approved out there and we have no sidewalks, we have two lane roads. I live on Cloverdale, that, that road was supposed to be widened to five lanes five years ago. And there, it's not even in the five year plan for the section that I am on. Um, right now, ACHD is considering not even taking their 3% for their next budget. They're contemplating a 0% increase. That will impact their CIP. It will impact their five-year work plan. They don't know exactly the how much that will affect it, but there are several people over there screaming that they don't even have money to put in sidewalks, um, pedestrian crossings, other community projects. And, and so just take that into consideration when you are deliberating tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, come on up, please. I am Mark Dunkley, 10151 West Victory Road. I'm one of the sellers of the property uh, to be happened. Uh, I have lived here since 1958, in which 34,000 people lived here then. Currently, we have two, over 250,000 here in Boise. Change is constant. And great things, I'd rather live here now than back in the 1958 when I came because of the population increase. Good things happen. I'm selling my property because I have a bad heart. I'm tired of taking care of cows and pastures, and I want a break. And so, but I do want to stay in there because I love the area. I love what the developer has done in keeping the pond. No one here enjoys the pond because it's private. The pond will be enjoyed by the public. The common areas will be enjoyed by the public. Um, people will enjoy walking in a neighborhood that is secluded. And I think there's this great, the integrity of the trees in the South will help keep the pri privacy of those people in the South. The lots are larger. The lots generally are only one and one and a half lots per, uh, um, per person there. Um, Everyone will enjoy the, the, the property. The irrigation concerns, my property is the lowest portion of all the properties. The lateral that goes through my property has never been flooded in the 16 years that I have been here. Uh, the problem with Joe's property is just on the, on the southeast corner with just two properties there. It is not the whole property, it is just that little portion. My property, there's no problem with the laterals. There is no wildlife on my lateral. When that goes dry in, the, in, the, in, in October, nothing's there. It's all in the pond. All the wildlife stays with the pond. So you keep the pond, you develop that, you have some great things that happens there and people can enjoy. Traffic with HEHD, uh, since Mitchell is a collateral, uh, it has a, a possibility maximum of 425 VPH uh, per, per day, I guess, or however they product it, with addition of the additional um, um, subdivision that brings it only up to about 110 VPH uh, uh, in the uh, 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 maximum traffic times. Uh, people have been playing, complaining about traffic and voice for the last 30 years. And so there's no difference between now and 30 or 40 years ago. Um, I apologize to my neighbors for getting old and having a heart problem and wanting to stay alive. Uh, I do have uh, one problem. The historical building is not very historical. If you've been in that home, I have been in there many times. There is nothing great about that home to be preserved. Um, also, as far as Jill's comment on walking around her, I think uh, we were here a half an hour before and tw 20 minutes before we were able to get in here. So I think there's no problem with having this as being a public meeting. Um, The only problem I have is the fence. 
and I'm not a part of the of the of the um, developer. I have nothing to do with him. I want to stay in here, and and also the fence. They they have predicted the vinyl thank you, fence. Sir. That's it. that's the end of your time. Okay, sorry. Thank you. If you ask me about the final fence, I'll tell you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, great. A, a part of my PowerPoint that had a picture that showed the lot sizes as they exist now across the street. Could you pull that back up, please? Again, it's still Longhurst, um, and I'm at 9,900 Roan Meadows, West Roan Meadows, I guess. That's something they're making us add. I never said West before. While Mr. Holmes pulls that up, I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, when I heard Mr. Holmes reference um, one of the commissioner's questions about he thought that there would be within uh, 2021 through 2025 changes to victory, that was a surprise to me. My uh, group of neighbors and I had contacted um, ACHD and it was our understanding that we were looking at seven to 10 years before there would be any legitimate thing. As to the um, size, could you go to, mm, keep going down. More, 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 more. Thank you, more. Right there, um, where, your, where your cursor is, if you could do that. Yes, that'd be great. You click on that one, please. Um, actually, go up to, there you go, sorry. I just wanted to talk about the home size. The homes here are significantly smaller on um, what's proposed, and this was the original uh, proposal. If you look across the street to the Carolina Place, those are much smaller. The uh, developer's comments about that this is all within the size and that those houses get smaller as they get toward victory is not accurate. That's an accurate assessment of what the properties look like. And I think that this is a relevant visual aid for all of us to understand what we're talking about. Um, there was a comment that was made um, to Mr. Holmes a minute ago about whether or not this proposal was within the comprehensive plan. And his response was, if we're going to go against the comprehensive plan, this is an appropriate way to go. My question is, why are we going against the comprehensive plan? We are not without homes. We are not without development properties. There is no need to do so. Um, and I, I would strongly urge you to require us not to look at this is something to go against the comprehensive plan, but to stay within it so that we can have a nice transition between the homes. It's an accurate, factually fair one. And my final comment would be that when we're talking about this plan community development, we're going, we're going to save the pond. I think that that's sort of talking about the emperor's new clothes. As one of the commissioners pointed out, this pond isn't going away. There's a lot of things that would have to happen before this pond would go away. They're stuck with the pond. So really what they're talking about is putting a path around the pond and putting the pond in a much smaller area than it is and then putting some rocks out. And in order for you to say that this is part of a planned community development, it has to have some benefit. And all, as far as I can tell, it's boulders. And I don't know what size it is, but I was, joking with my daughter about this, the size of boulder we have, I have yet to hear a single person say the perfect subdivision is the one with some climbing rocks in it, a few boulders for the kids to go sit on. That is not a benefit. That is adding nothing to this particular area. So there's no reason to pretend that this is some major benefit and they need these zoning variances. So it asked the commission to deny that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else here that we have not heard from that would like to speak tonight? Okay, so moving on to the virtual attendance. If you are, um, if you have joined us virtually and you'd like to speak on this item tonight, please virtually raise your hand um, and we will just start at the top and work our way down. Um, so first I see uh, Cynthia uh, Ray Savage. It's Cynthia Ross Savage. Thank you. Well, if you like for me to spell it, it's R-A-S-A-V-A-G-E. My address is 9801 West Arabian Drive, Boise 83709. Um, I'm, I am opposed to the traffic, the density of the property itself. I'm at the other end of um, Mitchell at the very end. Um, in 2018, it was a dead end street. And because of South Creek going in, they did put it through, but it will end at our house. Um, ACHD just took it off of their five-year plan about it going from um, Arabian Drive to Amity. It will never go through. Um, I'm Not only do I care about how many more cars are gonna go in front of my house, I'm concerned about Mitchell itself. 
um, in the five-year plan the ACHD has, there is no plan at all for them doing any improvements. Currently it has no curbs, no gutters, no sidewalks. So the children that have to wait on the school bus have to wait in the middle of the street at 7 a.m. during the winter and there's no street light and it's very dangerous and we're gonna add more cars coming up through there. Uh, we have a 20 mile per hour speed limit. People are tailgating me all the time because I do follow the 20 miles per hour because you never know who's walking in the middle of the street. We have a lot of people um, walking their dogs, their children, the children coming to school to Amity Elementary um, or they use that path coming down um, Mitchell. Um, I'm not opposed to the new development. I'm opposed to how many houses are going in there. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Barbara Crump, please. Barbara, do we have you there? Yes. Uh, my name is Barbara Crump, 3921 South Mitchell Street. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, committee. The traffic and congestion is a major issue. Um, just last week, I was, uh, as Cynthia mentioned, tailgated going 20 miles and the car pulling off of Victory on to South Mitchell was 10 car lengths behind me as I'm doing 20 miles an hour before he came up right behind me, was so angry and frustrated and passed. When we chose our home, we had already fallen in love with the neighborhood before we chose it as we were looking for a house on Arabian. The speed limit there is 25 miles an hour. All these neighborhoods that are being built that are new are 25 miles an hour. So they're coming on to South Mitchell, which is not a subdivision. It's semi-rural. And I have not seen them easily transition into driving through a semi-rural neighborhood where we enjoy people riding their horses, people walking down the street, as well as all the kids go going to and from school. Uh, we find a lot of traffic, moms and dads driving their children down South Mitchell, dropping their kids off uh, at the back school and then driving back down South Mitchell. I can't believe that all these people moving into this new subdivision would turn out onto South Mitchell and go straight to Victory. They would also increase the traffic. And I don't know any mention of the speed limit on what this neighborhood is going to have. Um, basically, I have no problem against the subdivision going in. Yes, the state is growing. People want to move in here. We have to provide housing. and. It appears to be a very thoughtful and considerate plan. However, if you came and walked our neighborhood, it is nowhere near com um, compatible with the neighborhood. We're semi-rural. And even if you go across Victory, you've got a neighborhood that is not nearly as congested as what they're proposing. Yes, we have animals and uh, cows and we like it that way. And I chose this neighborhood specifically because when I moved to Idaho, I wanted to be in a neighborhood that this state has this wonderful selection that you can live downtown urban or you can live in the county and have a semi-rural neighborhood. I really feel this would negatively impact this whole area as well as property values as well as safety. Time. Thank you, Ms. Crump. Um, next, we'll hear from Linda Rain. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanna say I definitely agree with what Cynthia said about the traffic and the speed limit. And also what Barbara said, we live at 3600 South Mitchell Street. So we live right at the top of the hill and you can't see when somebody is stopped on the side of the road, you can't see to get around them safely. 
because your block your vision is blocked. So I don't know if anybody's taken that into consideration. The speed limit since the uh, South Creek subdivision went in has been ridiculous. The sheriff comes out every now and then, and I say, wait five minutes, you'll get two speeders. It is, it's really bad, really bad. Um, also, I'd like to see half acre lots to go along with what Diamante subdivision is doing. We fought that subdivision as well and used the Boise comprehensive plan to do it. And they put in half acre lots. And I would also like to see that. As far as um, the only entrance to and from this subdivision is gonna be on Mitchell. What happens when um, a fire engine get, needs to get in there and an ambulance, are they allowed to only have one entrance to and from and into a subdivision as for safety? Also, um, Mitchell is two lanes. So when you go down at the end of Mitchell to turn on to Victory, you can only turn either right or left, of course. There is a center turn lane, but it's gonna increase um, accidents. Because, I mean, you, right now, like Jill said, you wait you know, five or six minutes just to get out there onto Mitchell, I mean, onto Victory. Also, since we've lived here since 2005, they've changed the time, what, when they're gonna widen Victory, I don't even know how many times. And the last I heard also, I think someone mentioned is, there is no plan to widen victory. So what do we do in the meantime? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rain. Next, we'll hear from Todd Merritt. Is that okay? Uh, hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, uh, my name's Todd Merritt. I live at 9682 West Roan Meadows Court. I'm the president of the HOA for the Diamante uh, subdivision. Uh, my wife and I looked for homes for over a year. Uh, the Diamante subdivision is a new subdivision. Um, my home is 10 months old. Uh, we were thrilled to find a place in Boise where we could build a new home and have space in between the houses. We were absolutely thrilled. Um, the music subdivision, the problem I have with it is the density. Uh, they uh, seem to want to identify with the neighborhood to the north of them, which is on the other side of Victory Road, uh, which is this, the most significant divider. Uh, the neighbors that are the most adjacent to that neighborhood are to the west and the south and the east, and the smallest lots are half acre. Uh, they go one acre, some of them are, are even larger. Um, so I do not believe that R1B is an appropriate designation. I think it should be R1A um, so that it is aligned with uh, the neighborhood that it is in, not the one that's across the street on Victory. Uh, the neighborhood here, people have houses, uh, shops, um, they have animals, it's, it's very rural. Um, and we were very happy to find a neighborhood that wasn't uh, jam-packed with the houses uh, so close together that uh, you can almost jump from one to the other. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Merritt. Next, we'll hear from Dustin Patterson. Yes, hello, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Dustin Patterson, and I live at 9651 West Roan Meadows Court, uh, also in the Diamante subdivision. Uh, I agree with what has been said already by my neighbors, and as a lifetime resident of Southwest Boise, I'm also just very concerned about the uh, traffic increase and the proposed density of the homes in the new music subdivision. Um, really comparing that proposal to uh, the neighborhoods that are in the area, I, I think that you'd be best suited to compare it to uh, my neighborhood, the Diamante one. And I echo what Todd said, uh, we bought out here specifically because they had half acre lots and we had some more space to stretch out. Um, I, I think that that would be a, a lot better comparison than the neighborhood that you find uh, to, the, to the north. Um, so once again, I just echo all the concerns that have been, already been mentioned this evening and uh, just hope that you consider the concerns of the homeowners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Uh, next is Richard Llewellyn. Richard Llewellyn, 9170 Hill Road. Am I coming through? Yes. Great, thank you. So um, lots of excellent uh, 
questions, I think, from Planning and Zoning Commission. And I would like to you know, commend you for all of your, your great questions, great insights, and great questions and points from the neighborhood. And it really strikes me how different uh, this uh, proceeding is from the earlier one in the Haystack subdivision in, in Barber Valley, uh, where the neighborhood had a chance to really work out and hash out the issues uh, with the developer. And, and now the main point of contention is what color should the pedestrian beacon be? Um, I don't hear about any pedestrian beacons um, being installed here, even though we all know that out in this part of the uh, hinterlands of Boise, uh, pedestrian concerns, traffic concerns are, are, are really front and center. So Elaine Clegg, uh, President Council Pro Tem, um, has often uh, evokes the process that was used to uh, bring people together, uh, neighborhood concerns and developers to come up with Barber Valley plans. And I think that's why um, now we are only hearing about what color is the pedestrian, should the pedestrian beacon be. And, and you saw the, all those great uh, pathways, uh, cycling pathways, pedestrian pathways, open spaces in that part of town. Why is it so different? You know, why is it so different out in Southwest Boise? I, is it the people are different? You know, is it, is it, it just worth less in some way? I don't know. I don't think we really think any of those things. I think it's just history. And I think we've come to accept that uh, people in certain parts of Boise, just those neighborhoods don't deserve on some level, the same amount of care and handling um, from during the whole process. So despite all of your very good questions and your attention now, I just feel it's a little too late. I wish that so many of these issues could have been brought up between the neighborhood and the developer with Boise planning staff really upholding the livability components of Boise Blueprint for this area of town. Um, what are some of those? Um, that issue brought up again by planning and zoning commissioners as well as uh, neighborhoods about the laterals and the trees. Yes, if you, it's not just burying the laterals, you're also piping them, meaning you're never, you no longer get the groundwater recharge. Yes, those trees will die. That pond may not continue to be full of water either in the winter, unless you pump water to it. Uh, you know, having grown up in similar country myself, yeah, this is what we have here. You know, we have these laterals, we have um, these ripe, semi-riparian kinds of proxies uh, with our irrigation systems. It's what makes these areas um, livable to us. You know, it, it, it represents a lot more. So I really hope you continue to listen and, and strive to preserve those elements. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Llewellyn. Uh, next up is Milena Hickey. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm at 3185 South Linda Vista Avenue, um, also in the Diamante neighborhood. I agree with a lot that has been said. Um, my backyard is exactly on Mitchell. I'm concerned about um, not just the building part when they start building the dust and the, and the pollution and everything that comes from that. Obviously, um, progress has to be made and a lot of points have been made that are very good. Um, my main concern is the only entrance into that neighborhood, into that new neighborhood. And the density of the house is there. Uh, my husband happens to be a fireman and it was said about um, access to those homes. I know there's another access to it and it shouldn't be a problem, but Let's say there's a fire. I mean, they're so close together right now. Um, that is a problem. If those people want to get out in a rush, you're going to have a major problem trying to get everybody out on one street. Even if there is another um, egress road to, to Victory or to other places. That's one point. The second point is um, if we ever get out of the lockdown and people go back to school and traffic is what it is. It's already a lot more than it was. Um, I agree with those people saying um, there is a lot of traffic going and specifically going from um, going into Victory. Um, there is a downhill 
um, road and it ices up in the winter and people, I mean, you, you're gonna have accidents there if, if people um, are not aware of that. Also, um, a lot of people are gonna cut through our Diamante neighborhood to get over to the other side and just do a quick, quick, um, you know, get home, cutting home um, um, shortcut. And um, I think there could be some big potential for um, accidents with children in our neighborhood. So, um, and that's the part. Besides, I will miss the peacock. So that's my five cents to it. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hickey. Next, um, we have Kevin Spiegel. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Kevin Spiegel, 9990 Roan Meadows Drive. Um, I've got my wife here as well. We just logged in together. So I guess I'm speaking for the two of us, if that's okay. Um, I just wanted to kind of echo what everybody else uh, has, has brought up as concerns so far. Um, I just, I also wanted to just read a couple things off of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, blueprint for Boise. Um, about Southwest and the neighborhood character. Um, and two points here. Uh, uh, point one is to encourage the use of public parks and other open space areas as community farms and gardens to preserve the rural and agricultural heritage of the Southwest, which I don't think there's anything about agriculture in this, uh, this new subdivision. There's also promote the continuation of existing agriculture in the Southwest and look for opportunities to expand urban agriculture and new developments. And lastly, open fencing and other design features shall be used to the greatest extent feasible to retain the semi-rural character of the Southwest. And this really brings up that, that idea of what the Southwest feels like. And, and I believe it was uh, Mr. Gillespie who was asking how, how the, houses not right next to uh, those of us on grown meadows, uh, how those being on smaller lots would impact us. And it really comes down to that, that feel, that semi-rural character that the Southwest currently has. And it sounds like everybody uh, who's testified here would like it to continue having. Um, and, and again, just to, to kind of reemphasize that point that R1B is supposed to have 9,000 square feet uh, lots or larger. And I counted up all the lots that don't meet that in, um, in this subdivision, and it's 47 of them, which is more than half or two thirds of the lots. I uh, don't even meet the designation for R1B. Um, so I don't see how you, could, how you can even say that it's an R1B designation, but two thirds of the lots don't even meet the requirements for that. Um, so I think we even need to say it's R1C. Uh, which doesn't fit into the large lot uh, use or, um, or the lots need to be increased in their size to actually meet that R&B designation. Um, and then my last one, just about the traffic as well. And I know we've spoken a lot about uh, how it will impact Victory, but I'm just as concerned about how it will impact Mitchell. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got two kids, they're, they're six and eight right now, and they walk to school, to Amity Elementary. Um, well, when school is in session, uh, and and the amount of traffic that this could cause on Mitchell, I just I'd just be worried for their safety as they're trying to walk to school. There's no sidewalk. There's no improvement. It's uh, you know it's not a super wide road. It's not it's not marked. It's it's uh, just a concern that I could uh, that I have for my children. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Next, we have William Martin. All right, can you hear me? Yes, say yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, uh, I, I agree with what has been said uh, primarily regarding the density um, and how many new homes and the effect that's gonna have on, on traffic. Thank you. William, can you give us your name and address for the record, please? Thank you. Yeah, it's William. <laughs> William Martin, 4040 South Mitchell. Thank you. Go ahead, William. 
I already, I already spoke. You didn't hear anything. <laughs> we got your name and address. <laughs> okay. Well, I, um, I just agree with uh, the the density concerns and the effect that's going to have on traffic. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Elena Cardwell. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Elena Cardwell. I live on 3083 South Linda Vista Place, also um, in Diamante subdivision. And just like many of my neighbors before, I just wanted to point out that we purchased the home a year ago, also after a long search for a larger lot in the city of Boise where we're not feeling congested and squeezed together. So we'll love where we are. And um, my backyard will be actually directly behind, um, well, directly across Mitchell from Music Subdivision. So we are literally, backyard is facing Victory and Mitchell intersection. And the amount of traffic is a huge, huge concern for us. We're basically looking at what, roughly 60 homes everybody will have two to four cars. So I cannot even imagine 180 cars coming in and out every day, um, going to work and daycare and school. So that is our main point and main concern. And I'll, um, I agree with everything that's been said before. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll next hear from Raymond Anderson. Uh, just give us one second, please. Okay, please go ahead, Mr. Anderson. Can you hear me okay? Yes. My name is Raymond Anderson. I'm on 9602 West Wright Street. I've been here with my family for 16 years. Just to give you a little you're, idea. You're a little quiet. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, I've been, uh, I've been here at 9602 West Wright Street for 16 years. Just to give you an idea. Of I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson. We're still having, tr it's still a little too quiet. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. In the last 16 years, uh, just to give you an idea of what goes on here south of uh, this area, I've had 38 head of beef cattle through this small two acres that I have. So I've been contributing to the flies in the area. I will agree with Mr. Dunkley that uh, there's really nothing but stories about the houses. I've been in them. They're nice, but I don't see what they're doing. The big problem. I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson, we seem to have lost you again. Can you get closer okay. to the microphone? Okay. How about now? It's still Good. a little you did. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. With the uh, rest of the group, the traffic is a big problem. In addition to my street, Mitchell, Lone Meadows, and De Monte are going to be clogged with traffic. The, uh, also, it's going to put a lot of pressure on Maple Grove. The, the roads have not been prepared for the amount of traffic that's going to come through here. And I agree with many of the people who have spoken today that one half acre lots is the smallest that you can hear in this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, next, we have Steve Hamlet. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm Steve Hamlet. I've got my wife, Rebecca, with me. We live at uh, 3217 South Linda Vista Avenue in the Diamante subdivision. And like our other neighbors in here, we, we were looking for more space to be able to you know, not have our neighbors on top of us. Um, so, I mean, our... We share this concerns that everybody else has uh, expressed so far, but um, it's mostly just the density of that subdivision that kind of concerns us. And consequently, I think a lot of the traffic will end up diverting through our subdivision to get out to victory. I mean, it's, we get a lot of people speeding through here already. I mean, I know there's been complaints about Road Meadows too, but I mean, we've got some small children in here now and they continually have people blowing past our house to, trying to get around that corner at victory and Mitchell. Um, so it's just, I, I think it's just going to exaggerate it if we have, you know, another 67 homes right across the street here. So I'm not, we're not opposed to the subdivision, but it's just the density that concerns us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Hamlet. Um, we have quite a few people who didn't raise their hands, but I have their names on this sheet. So if you still would like to speak, um, please virtually raise your hand. I will go down this list and call out names, um, but we'd like to see that virtual hand raised. Um, so first on this list, I have Allison Hawes. Allison, would you like to speak? Okay. Oh, can you hear me? We can. I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I was glad to see that the trees have been addressed. Uh, we are at 9980 West Roan Meadows Drive. Um, and like everyone else, we bought here because of the location and the rural feel of not being on top of our neighbors. Um, and the privacy is huge. Um, so I'm glad to see that they're planning on keeping those trees, um, but safety and having that one entrance into set so many homes with so many extra cars and fam you know, family members and mostly, you know, you're gonna get a lot of teenagers driving in and out of there too. Um, fire issues. I, I just agree with everyone so far. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Chester Ball. Chester, did you still wanna to speak tonight? Please go ahead and start for everybody. Please remember to start with your name and address. Chester, did you wanna to speak tonight? Okay, I'm gonna take the silence as forfeiting the opportunity to speak on this item. Madam Chair, I might just add that phone number and webinar ID to the chat. So if, if anyone cannot participate. Okay, we're going to add the telephone number and uh, meeting ID to the chat. If you are there on public, you're having any audio difficulties, um, please feel free to go ahead and call in. And then if you can virtually raise your hand, we'll know that you want to speak. Um, next on the list I have is Francis Smith. Do we have a Francis Smith that would like to speak tonight? Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to keep moving. Glenda Jenkins. If you're on the phone, go ahead and press star nine to virtually raise your hand if, if you were waiting on that. So after Glenda Jenkins, oh, we have one hand up. Okay, Mon go ahead, Monica. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, please start with your name and address. Okay, my name is Monica Knight and my address is 9504 Bean Apple Drive. Um, my husband and I have lived in that home for almost 15 years now, and we've seen the traffic really increase. Um, it's, we have a hard time getting out on Maple Grove. We use Mitchell a lot to get out of the subdivision, and it's gotten a lot heavier as more and more subdivisions have come in around our acre lots. Um, my biggest concern is the traffic going up Mitchell and the children that walk to school on that road. I feel like it's going to be dangerous for them. I'm also a little concerned that um, the school is already pretty full. Amity Elementary has four classes per grade and um, over 30 students per class and 67 new homes going in uh, will heavily affect the already over full school at Amity Elementary. Um, so I don't oppose the, the subdivision, but I would like to see a lower density and closer to half size acres. Thank you. Do you want to say anything? Thank you. Next on the list is Karen Darrington. Do we have a Karen that would like to speak tonight? Oh, oh. okay, great. 
we do have a Karen Darren. <laughs> Am I here now? You Thank are. Please start with your name and address. Uh, Karen Darrington, 9290 West Lyle Street. And uh, we've lived here for 27 years. Our street is a dead end street. And several years ago, a developer bought 12 acres at the end of our street and wanted to put in 40 some houses um, with only one uh, entrance and that was Lyle Street. And we went through the process through Boise City and Ada County commissioners. And um, it's been a long process, but I would like to say that the developer has just put in three, three acre homes, actually four four three acre homes in those 12 acres um, that he originally wanted to put 40 on. And the Boise Comprehensive Plan, the city council back then, this has been almost 10 years ago, we've been uh, through this process. And uh, they definitely wanted less density. Um, they suggested half acre to one acre lots. And um, it's been a long, long time coming, but uh, there are people out there who want larger acreages and our street, which is uh, just down the road from Mitchell. Um, it's been very, we've been very happy to see that uh, the density is smaller because we can't get out onto Maple Grove um, from our street and you're gonna have a heck of a lot more people trying to get out onto Mitchell in the morning. Thank and you, that's your time. Thank, thank you, you, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, so remaining on the list, um, if I call your name and you would still like to speak tonight, please virtually raise your hand. Um, that can be done through the program or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine. Um, so the names I have remaining are Kurt Sager, Megan Armstrong, Melissa Shane, Randall Shane, and Stephen Hickey. Um, so Kurt, do we have, I'm not seeing any new hands go up, but do we have, oh wait, there's one. <laughs> okay, we have one on the phone. Um, let's please go ahead, please start with your name and address. Uh, Glenda Jenkins, and we live at 3172 Black Hills Drive. Um, and I agree with everything that's been said against the current plan. The density is too high. It should be half acre lots. And we have lived at our house since 1983, and we've seen the traffic just explode. And we are worried about the cars having problem getting out on Mitchell to Victory and dealing with that intersection. And so coming down Roan Meadows and coming past our house on Black Hills to get out to Victory. And it's just um, not going to be a safe situation. So really the density is the key to maintaining the rural feel of this area. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Thank you. Thank. Okay, so I'm still not seeing any new virtual hands. Oh, there's one. Um, please go ahead, Michelle. Hi there. My, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Michelle Linsky. I live at 3080 South Linda Vista Place. Um, my husband and I, we actually we purchased the original home from the Diamante lot. And so I, I know that the original home could be purchased um, if it were put up for sale. I know it's possible. Um, I'm disappointed with Mr. Gillespie. Um, he kind of shrugged at the current zoning that's listed and kind of wanted to waver from that. Um, I do agree with my neighbors. Uh, I want to especially address the school issue. All of the schools, Amity Elementary, West Junior High School that uh, Amity feeds in and Bora High School that both of those feed into are some of the highest populated schools in the city of Boise. Um, and that just to state that the average lot size listed is not accurate. So thank you for your time. Thank you. So 
If you would last call, if you would like to speak on this item tonight, please virtually raise your hand. Madam Chair, we might just go down this attendee list time. and okay. call in on everyone that we haven't heard from yet. Okay, do we have Kurt Sager? I don't see him on okay. the list. Oh, okay. Uh, Megan Armstrong? And I don't see her on the list either. Um, we've got the Shanes, Melissa Shane. She is on she the call. She is on. Let me just unmute her. Hi, Melissa. Did you want to speak tonight? Just in case um, folks at home don't have the ability to see the chat, uh, the phone number you can call in on, give you a second to grab that pen, is 888 475-4499 and the webinar ID is 985-8581-4025. So again, that phone number is 888-475-4499 and then it will ask you for a webinar ID, which is 985-8581. 4025. I also have Randall Shane on my list, but I don't see him on the call. Um, and then Stephen Hickey. Who might have? We had a up. hand for a moment. I didn't see who. Oh, there we go. There it is. Okay. Actually, Stephen Hickey, this is Milena Hickey. He went to work. Um, okay. I just wanted to say that he wanted to speak, but he can't right now. And he agrees with a lot that was said. Okay. But if he's not and here. Also, yes. And there's also two people <laughs> I know they couldn't because of. Um, they didn't have access. Okay, thank you, Melina. Um, okay, so then Chester Ball. He is on the list. Do you see him, Paul? I'm here now. Okay, Can you hear me? Yes, please start with your name and address. This is Chester Ball. I'm at 9647 West Burnett Drive. Uh, again, um, the reason why I, I live in Diamante said division also, and the reason why we purchased here was the fact that, again, we're not on top of our neighbors. We've got space to, to breathe and live. And the fact that uh, I have two small children, they're gonna be going to school up and down Mitchell and some of the other areas we're adding all this traffic and one, one egress out of that neighborhood. We have three here in Diamante. And even that, we have speeders come down run, running down through here. So you're just going to increase our traffic through our neighborhood because they're going to try to get around Victory and, and Mitchell or any of the other egresses to, to get to those neighborhoods. So, um, and I agree with everything that's been presented for the density of the housing. I, I mean, I understand that progress has to be made. I, I get that, but... Um, that many houses and that small of uh, acreage is just too much for this side of this. I mean, we bought it because it had a rural feel and that's what we want to keep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Madam Chair, we do have uh, someone on the phone. I'm gonna allow them to speak. Great. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please start with your name and address. Yes, um, my name is Betty Berman Solo and I live at 1970 Cannon Arrow Way in Boise. And I'm approximately a mile from the property. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't, um, I didn't know that I'd be uh, back in time to uh, follow the meeting, but um, I, I wanted to add that uh, for years, um, 
developers have used transitional lot sizes more effectively than this developer has. And in other words, I live in a I live in a five acre subdivision, and and uh, against me is Boulder Creek and um, and Pepper Hills. And up against our five acre parcels, they put one acre and then half acre. Um, no problem with accommodating the number of people that are coming to um, to Boise in looking for diversity and looking for something that um, they might not find in other parts of Boise. And it's it really um, is a limited um, availability of of the kind of privacy and rural feeling that could be offered by Boise, um, but you know the developers have to to um, look at that, and and certainly the easiest way to do this is to put larger lots against existing large lot development, and. Um, I, I think that there certainly is an opportunity in um, subdivisions and, and certainly the music subdivision is one where this could decrease the density. Um, it, would, it would certainly um, afford people coming to this area for the same reasons that a lot of people um, have uh, come to this area. They're looking for more room. And um, those lots would would be very very um, desirable. So I hope the city looks at the possibility of holding on to a jewel in the southwest rather than letting it go um, for the highest density. Um, the the zoning, as I understand it, means that you can go from one to eight or one to five, you can start with one lot in that zone. You don't have to go to the highest um, allowed density for that zone. So there's lots of options that the commission has that I think need to be thought about tonight. And I would certainly appreciate um, a, a very cautious um, decision uh, when you look at approving uh, this subdivision as it stands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we still have a few names on our list. Um, We're going to take a quick five minute break um, and reconvene at quarter after. Um, and hopefully that'll give a couple of the people that have had a hard time connecting the opportunity to connect um, and we will be back at it shortly. For anyone listening at home, again, that number is 888-475-4499. The webinar ID is 985-8581-4025. Oh. 
Not, well, I know if I write a bunch, you won't be able to just uh, sure. pick up a little bit. Oh, the, the one that keeps getting pushed out by that guy? Yeah. Oh, you mean you got the Yeah. Yeah. It's only eight more or nine more months. Or is it where I start with the issue? Yeah. Application, and then there's the sidewalk oh, okay. available. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, So the guy has a legal right. So whatever goes there is going to have to be a certain point. Because they determined it. So I Okay, we're going to start up again now. Um, I'm going to call, we will call one more time on people who have signed up that we have not heard from yet, um, that we know are on the line. And we, as a commission, are particularly interested in any new information outside of the traffic and density comments that we've heard. Um, so we will try... Let me try first. Uh, we'll start with uh, Francis Smith. Do we have a Francis Smith on the line? I do not see that. Okay, Kurt Sager. What about um, Megan Armstrong? Melissa Shane.
Madam Chair, there are also a few other attendees that weren't on our advanced sign-up sheet. Um, Abby Lasinski. Abby, if you'd like to speak tonight, please go ahead. We can hear you now. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Please start with okay. your address and you'll have three minutes. Okay, um, Abigail Lisinski, 9665 West Rhone Meadows Court, Boise, Idaho. Um, I'm also in the Diamante subdivision and I just would like to agree with what everybody said about the density concerns and overloading the schools and the traffic and all of those things are very concerning. I also have two little children and I don't want them driving through our subdivision to try to avoid traffic because that would be unsafe here. for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is, if there's anybody new that has joined the call that would like to speak tonight, please virtually raise your hand. Madam Chair, the other person that I see is Andrew Odom. Andrea, would you like to testify on this item tonight? Okay, not hearing from Andrew. Madam Chair, I believe that's everyone okay. on the attendee list and the sign-up sheet. Great. I think we can do last call. Okay, so this is the official last call. If you would like to testify on this item tonight, please virtually raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, we will move to the applicant for a five minute rebuttal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so in, in terms of rebuttal, again, Heath Clark, 251 East Front Street. Um, I'll try to hit a couple of items and then wrap up, I think, on the items that were of, of the most, that we, we heard the most about. So with regard to the, the three story question, uh, we did make the representation on the record. That is a commitment. And if, if folks are more comfortable with that being a condition of approval, we're more than happy to include that. Uh, with regard to emergency access, we have provided all required accesses to meet code. There is a dual use emergency access onto Victory Road. Um, with regard to trees, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it appears that we, we will be able to preserve over 200 trees on this site. That's not a number that I say very often in connection with any application. Um, in addition to that, there's at least 300 new trees that will be uh, planted. Trees, of course, will be on irrigated common areas so or within irrigated portions of lots. Now, with regard to the question of what happens after the developer leaves, um, trees are very expensive to take down. Uh, you know, landowners are not going to take those down willy-nilly unless they have to. Um, you know, one thing that as we were talking about it while we were listening to the testimony that, you know, maybe it might be something that we could explore is having a provision in the CCNRs that speaks to mature trees being removed only if an arborist uh, notes that they're at their end of life or deceased. Um, that's something that we could include in CCNRs, and I think would be something that could be functional. I, I don't think anything beyond that would be functional. I think folks should be able to, to take care of their, of their lawns and their landscape. Uh, with regard to the pond, uh, there was some pretty uh, kind of direct testimony suggesting that we're stuck with it. Um, just for reference, there used to be three ponds out there. Um, the current landowner has already filled two. There is no requirement that we keep that pond. Um, and Mr. Dunkley was exactly correct. You know, that pond was previously a private amenity, wasn't, wasn't something that the public had access to. This is now something that the public will have access to through the trail uh, system that we are proposing. And, you know, we think that's a great amenity. And to go back to the PUD topic, that is something that the PUD allows us to, to provide. Uh, with regard to traffic, uh, we will be dedicating additional right-of-way 
along Victory Road and building a left turn lane on Mitchell. And then I'll just also point out that uh, the, the, you know, this is ACHD staff report. ACHD does have victory on its CIP for between 2021 and 2025. And again, they have approved the project. Uh, with regard to the R1B zoning, again, R1B is an approved zone within the large lot category of Blueprint Boise. Uh, we agree with staff that this zoning designation is appropriate for property that is at the intersection of the suburban and large lot uh, categories on in Blueprint Boise and is on a significant transportation corridor. Even with the PUD that's proposed, we remain within the R1B density range. Now, I'll just point out, now, um, Mrs. Berman Solo had indicated that it was appropriate to go from five acres to one acre lots in the development that she was pointing to on the outer periphery. Proportionally, we are not that extreme and we don't create even that much contrast. Our lots on the southern boundary are larger than what that proportion would dictate. So let me just end with one note. Um, I've heard the, con the, the term smart growth used a couple of times during the, the course of this, e of this evening. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, we should go to half acre lots and then that should be the end of it. So, but I think it begs the question of what is smart growth? You know, smart growth is infill. Smart growth is development near transportation corridors. It's development near existing city services with densities that a city can efficiently serve. Half acre lots on a significant transportation corridor is not smart growth. So I will just leave it at that. And you know, we think that we have addressed the requirements for this application under city code. We think we've proposed something that uh, ap appropriately transitions and we would ask for a recommendation of approval. If it's not the commission's intent to recommend approval, we would ask for clear direction on the items that we could uh, do in order to gain that recommendation for approval. And I'm happy to stand for any last questions. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, at this point, we will close the public portion of the hearing and the item is before the commission. Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. All right, I'll get this party started, see where, where we're headed. Uh, I'm going to recommend approval of CAR 20-5 and SUB 20-9 and approve PUD 20-13. With the terms and conditions in the staff report, um, as written with the following modifications, I'd like to add a condition that the applicant uh, submit a tree mitigation plan for the proposed project. And I'd like to uh, remove condition number four requiring detached sidewalks. I'll second that to get the conversation going. A second from uh, Commissioner Gillespie. Discussion. Madam Chair. Commissioner Schaefer. Um, lots of good points this evening, uh, both for and against. Um, obviously, by my motion, I'm tending towards approval. 
I do feel that the R1B zoning <laughs> zoning is appropriate for this uh, this property as we are in a transition between uh, Ada County and uh, the city of Boise. Um, I feel like the applicant has addressed the transition between lot sizes uh, pretty effectively. Large uh, lots along the south boundary, uh, buffering to those larger properties to the south. And then um, in general, I think matching the lot sizes across Victory to the north. Uh, there was quite a, quite a bit of uh, obviously testimony in regards to uh, the buffering or uh, the feel of the development. And we spent a lot of, quite a bit of time discussing the buffer on the south side of the site. But what was neglected was the fact that there are going to be 30 foot landscape buffers along Mitchell and Victory Roads. Uh, in addition to that, along Mitchell, you're also going to get a sidewalk, a detached sidewalk with curb and gutter. So I think that the connectivity issue uh, has been dealt with by the applicant. Uh, I think that as you look at the site now, with the exception of the large trees on the south property line, there are really no trees at all or landscape along Mitchell or Victory Road. So my view is that even though there are going to be potentially 60 homes, 67 homes in this development, there's also gonna be a 30 foot landscape buffer separating those homes from the street and from the neighboring subdivisions. So uh, to me, I feel like that's exactly why we have landscape buffers. So in a condition like this, where we're replacing farmland or more agra agrarian uses with development, those landscape buffers help to protect the neighboring property owners, correct? So um, I just wanna make that point. Secondarily, you know, the applicant spoke to this towards the end of testimony that, you know, fire access has been dealt with. They are providing the required emergency access points into the site. Um, and I do agree with the applicant that the pond currently is a piece of private property. And now you're going to have a subdivision with uh, sidewalks and connectivity to that pond that allow neighbors in neighboring subdivisions to walk into that neighborhood and through that common open area. So uh, I do agree with the applicant in that, uh, in that instance. Um, I think that also the, the only other point I'll make right now is that I think that this is a good opportunity for uh, downsizing. We heard a lot of testimony from neighbors that love this neighborhood, okay? And a lot of those neighbors love this neighborhood because it, they live on half acre lots or one acre lots. So what happens 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, they, they wanna stay in the neighborhood, but they can't maintain their property anymore. Well, this would be a perfect example of something that you could buy to stay in the neighborhood that you love, but have less to, to care for. So I think there's an opportunity here to share this uh, strong neighborhood with another population that maybe doesn't want the large lots. So. Those are my two cents. I'd love to hear what my fellow commissioners have to say. Madam Chair. Commissioner Bratnover. Yeah, um, so I'm opposing this development um, primarily because where we are with respect to zoning, the density and the setbacks do not conform to an R1B zoning that's desired. We've heard most of the people get up and object to that as the primary issue. Um, the lot sizes are significantly smaller than those of the RM, R1B developments to the north by probably about 37%. Um, and I really can't see a good reason for those choices except to just jam more units into this property. Um, trading off the pond as an amenity in return for the excessive density is not a quid pro quo that we should entertain. There's no guarantee how long that pond is gonna stick around anyway, as was made very clear by the applicant and by Mr. Dunkley. Um, furthermore, the proposal does not conform to the comprehensive plan. And so while that's occasionally or often viewed as just, just a guideline, in this case, we've got an application that goes against both the code and the comp plan and that makes it untenable. Um, I've heard 
many, many of the neighbors support a subdivision here, um, a subdivision that respects the surrounding neighborhoods and the character of the area. Um, I also support a subdivision here uh, that conforms to the minimum 9,000 square foot lot sizes, um, puts a reasonable number of lots in there. This plan does not do that and should not be approved. Madam Chairman. Commissioner Gillespie. So, um, boy, this is a tough one. Let me just run through my thinking. I'm not sure where I stand it, with your leave. Um, so when we really get down to it, uh, the issue here is traffic and also sort of this amorphous issue of, of there's just too much density. And when you try and drill down on what exactly people are worried about like what is the actual adverse impact of that density we heard things like privacy we heard things like concern about neighbors not or complaining about animals we heard um concern about safety of children uh we heard concern about you know irrigation and drainage some of those concerns don't go away if we reduce the density, right? So the, you know, if we put this all R1A or R1B and made them conform to those zoning requirements, there would still be big changes on this property one way or the other with respect to some of the wildlife issues and just the idea that there's 18 open acres, right? That, that's gonna go away either way. So the question I'm struggling with is what's the marginal adverse impact of the extra 20 or 25 houses that go in in the middle of this thing? Because along that southern boundary, the applicant's right. I mean, they're going to be nine. There are currently nine lots to the south, and he is proposing 14 lots facing those nine. So that's a ratio of 1.55 new lots facing the nine old lots. So it's hard for me to understand that that in and of itself creates a big transition issue. So I'm struggling to figure out exactly what the difference is in terms of adverse impact between, let's say the 67 that they proposed. And if we made them go back and stick to the R1B lot sizes, it would go down to 40 say, I'm just guessing. But does that 40 really mitigate the concerns the neighbors had? Or do they still have the same concerns? So I'm struggling with that. I'd like to hear other folks thinking. Madam Chair. <clears throat> so I'm struggling with a lot of the same things. And um, I particularly, um, actually, before I, before I start, I want to compliment staff and um, Madam Chair you guys had a rough night tonight just in terms of managing the phone calls, the, <laughs> the chat, the emails, the, um, you know, the attendees on Zoom, the people in person. So I just want to compliment you and say that you've done a really great job. And um, I, I, I want to respond to the people in the neighborhood by saying that um, I think since people were able to attend by telephone, I think this has been open to the public and I'm very comfortable with moving forward. So I just wanted to put that on the record um, at, as well as complimenting staff and, and our chair. Um, with regard to um, the lot sizes, you know, we, um, I struggle with this too. And I think um, Commissioner Gillespie's done a really good job of sort of laying that question out there of, of like, well, so let's bring it down to 40, whatever the number would be if we just kept a straight R1B. And um, as always happens, almost always, when we talk about a PUD application, we're talking about um, what would ultimately result most likely in a cookie, what is a truly cookie cutter subdivision. So we wouldn't have the, um, the type of transition, you know, that, that, relates to and, and, and talks to the context of what's around it. Um, we wouldn't 
most likely have um, you know, a path going through it because it is the PUD process is all about this trade-off between um, you get a little extra density so that you create amenities. And it is more than, I, I'm gonna respectfully disagree with the neighborhood person who said um, it's just boulders. It's not just boulders. Um, there is a pond there. There's the condition of approval requires a path around the pond, an accessible path. Um, so I just I, I I think we are dealing with a, a common problem that we constantly deal with here when we deal with the PUD, which is what is that trade-off? Well, the trade-off for density is to have what really amounts to a nicer subdivision. And if we were to plat this um, in a normal R1B and we just stuck a grid on top of it um, and didn't have the meandering path and, and didn't have some of the other things that come with, with what's in front of us tonight, um, I think we'd actually end up with fewer trees <laughs> and um, you know some other some other problems, and we certainly wouldn't have the, the pond. So um, you know, I look at the location here, and I look at the aerial photos that are in the staff report, and um, I appreciate Commissioner Bratnober's um, calculations of thirty-seven percent. Um, but I, I also then go back to, well, so let's just, let's, let's make it a one-to-one -one ratio. And what are we, what do we get for that? Um, and I'm not sure that, um, that reducing it by that, uh, amount, um, reducing those, that percentage difference by that amount, um, is really going to get us what we really are going for. So, I, I think I'm gonna support the motion. Um, I'm pleased that the maker of the motion, Commissioner Schaefer, um, removed the um, detached sidewalks. I would be concerned that by putting detached sidewalks and requiring that in this subdivision that we would reduce the size of the lots even further. So I'm pleased with that. Um, and I, I support that in this particular case, it's not something I normally support, but I, I wanna just point out that I think in this case, it um, makes sense. And I also think that, um, you know, it is in the ACHD staff report that the capital improvement plan includes widening victory um, by 2025. And so, you know, by the time this actually gets built out, if in fact it goes that direction, um, we are gonna have a, a, a more accommodating roadway for um, the neighborhood. So I'm reluctant um, on this one. Um, I'm of course reluctant to lose those historic houses. And I'll just say for the record that um, it being a historic house does not make a beautiful house. Um, some, a lot of people think that, that it's the things that are not beautiful are not worth saving, but that's not actually how um, assessing a historic house works. And so I really appreciate staff requiring um, and putting it in the conditions that um, the State Historic Preservation Office will be permitted to, um, to record this. And that, just so everybody knows that's on this uh, on our commission, um, that's actually gonna come out of the developer's pocket. Um, the SHPO does not pay for that. So that's something the developer's gonna have to pay for to hire somebody to meet that condition. Um, and so I, I appreciate that, that, that they're doing that. I think it's awesome, the stuff that the neighborhood put in our packet. Um, I found it uh, really interesting, of course, as a historian, but also um, I do think that there's value in those houses and I'm really glad they're gonna be recorded um, if in fact they get demolished. So I think I am gonna be supporting the motion and um, I thank everyone for their, their time tonight. <laughs> Milt is waving feverishly at the screen in hopes that some of our other commissioners chime in. <laughs> Commissioner Blanchard. All right. I didn't want to step on my other commissioners, but uh, I want to thank everybody who came out tonight um, in, in whatever setting you came out, whether it was the city hall or whether it was the call in or participate virtually. Um, just to cut to the chase, I will be supporting uh, the motion, I'm really not wedded to the separated sidewalks one way or the other. Uh, it's probably not something that's really needed uh, within a subdivision with this type of access. Um, but just to cover a couple of points, uh, and Commissioner Gillespie really um, touched on the most important one, which is it, it just overwhelmingly, um, my sense is that the neighbors 
the neighbor's first preference would be uh, to have nothing happen at all. Um, second preference would be uh, to have it half acre lots, which is uh, just to be frank, uh, in this day and age, uh, in anything that's in the city of Boise's area of impact, I just cannot see half acre lots being zoned um, in the cards, uh, especially in an area like this. I think even if we were to say, okay, well then we're gonna make every lot in here R1B and make it uh, conform to that, I don't think they would be happy um, either. Um, so I, I just cannot see um, not allowing this uh, project to go forward in its, its current manner, just because I think um, at, at that point, we're, just, we're, we're still gonna end up with um, people having all the exact same concerns. <clears throat> that said, um, I'm not at all concerned with the traffic heading south because uh, Mitchell doesn't go through. Uh, so that's not something that I believe is a problem. Um, I think it's highly unlikely that there's going to be any cut through traffic through Diamante looking at the way um, that is set up. You would have to exit this proposed subdivision, make one, two, three, four hard uh, 90 degree turns to cut through that neighborhood. And I, I can't see anybody doing that, frankly. That just doesn't. Uh, and I'm very sensitive to traffic. I live on the Bora cut through street. We have 2,000 cars a day. Um, our families live in this house for 29 years, and we're finally getting speed bumps on our street after 29 years to slow down the Bora speedsters. Um, so I, I get traffic concerns, and I get children uh, safety concerns. Um, I don't see any concerns on that southern side. You've got uh, one with the buffer of trees, um, two. The houses that are on West Roan um, Meadows Drive uh, are set to, to the front of their lots closest to West Roan Meadow Drive. And so you're gonna have, with the backyard setbacks proposed um, in uh, this proposed subdivision here, I mean, you're gonna have these huge buffers. So I, I just can't see, um, I can't see uh, privacy as being frankly much of a concern um, there. So anyways, uh, that about covers what I had to talk about. So I'll, I'll be supporting the motion and I thank everybody for um, turning out and bringing up your concerns. Any other comments from the commission? Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Moore. I'd just like to say as well, um, just the way that the developers approach this with those larger lots kind of on that Southern border, um, keeping that the existing house on the large lot the and, and the pond as well. Um, some of those things, they kind of help help it feel more like the surrounding neighborhood while still getting a little bit more density. But by, you know, even though some of the dimensions might resemble an R1C zone, um, by zoning it as R1B, they're still limiting that density to a 4.8 units per acre instead of the eight units per acre that would be required, that would be allowed under an R1C zone. So by placing an R1B and maybe smaller lots to resemble, you're still limiting your density. You're still kind of help alleviating some of those concerns in addition to some of those larger lots that aren't, are on, lot, on those southern, that southern border too. So I'll be supporting the motion because of those efforts to kind of help alleviate but also help transition those larger lots that are existing to the south, uh, to the city of Boise and to some of that development to the north as well. Madam Chair. Commissioner Squires. I will be supporting the motion as well. Um, I would like to thank the developer, particularly for what um, he has agreed to do along the Southern boundary with the lot sizes, the setbacks, um, the home heights, the trees, uh, working with the irrigation. I think this is a well thought out plan. Uh, the only thing that I wish that we could potentially move forward with is the detached sidewalks. I will always advocate for detached sidewalks. They can be placed within an easement within the yard, so it would not reduce the yard size, but that is not a deal breaker for me. Um, I, just, I just like the look of them versus attached. But I will be supporting the motion. I do appreciate the neighbor's concerns. Um, but this is the area of impact. It is growing. And I think the developer has done an adequate job in transition. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, and I will lastly, well, are there any further comments from the commission before I add my own? Madam Chair. Oh, Commissioner Bradnover. Yeah, so um, just to, to kind of put a cap on my statements, um, it's not like we're talking about small differences in lot sizes. We're talking about 9,000 to 5,000. Now, my belief was that we've got things written in the code and the comprehensive plan to guide us. I've heard discussion that, well, gee, if we expand the lot sizes, it's going to make it worse. I, I, that, that one totally baffles me. That's beyond my, my, my ken there. Um, and I haven't heard a compelling, I've heard people ask, gee, how, is, how are smaller lot sizes going to material affect your life? Well, um, it's character of the neighborhood. Comp plan relies heavily on defining characters of neighborhoods. The other question that hasn't been asked nearly enough is, gee, if you went with something that actually conformed to R1B, things would be hunky-dory. It's a compromise. Yes, the neighbors would love to see half acre lots. Sorry, that's not, that's not where we are right now as a city, okay? Um, and obviously the developer would like to get as many, as many of those um, lots in there as, as possible. Mr. Clark said he'd like to understand if we didn't like it, um, or in this case, me, I guess, uh, if we didn't like it, what should he do differently? And that's easy, that's very straightforward. Replat it at something that conforms to R1B. Um, not asking for moving mountains here, but we've got, I think Commissioner Gillespie said it was about 47 lots or so, um, give or take, okay, over 40 lots um, that are, are significantly differ from um, R1B. And that's, that's what the change would be. That would be the change we'd ask of Mr. Clark and the developer. Um, but I, I, I'm pretty disappointed that we're looking at going for something which deviates so significantly um, and has been categorically identified by um, the neighbors as, as a problem. So that, those are my final words on the topic, except the vote. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to add my own thoughts here, um, I do also wanna thank staff. This is in my couple of years of experience on the commission, this has been our most accessible meeting, phone, email, online and in person. Um, and I will be supporting the motion. I think as the developer mentioned, um, this is smart growth. We, we aren't having to extend services um, and we are fulfilling the city's Grow Our Housing Initiative um, with this plan. We need to offer housing options in every neighborhood, big lots, small lots. Um, I think that we are working towards providing options. And there is a traffic plan from ACHD um, and the school district and the fire departments have both said that this works um, and we have to trust our professional experts. Um, I think with that, we can call for the vote. So we have a um, motion to recommend approval for CAR 20-5, um, also for SUB 20-9, and a motion to approve PUD 20-13 with the added conditions of approval of a tree mitigation plan for the project and to remove um, condition number four on the detached sidewalks. Can the clerk please call the vote? Stead? Aye. Schaefer? Aye. Squires? Aye. Blanchard? Aye. Moore? Aye. Aye. Dickens? Aye. Gillespie? Aye. Bratnober? Nay. Seven in favor, one opposed, motion carries. Thank you, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.